Can you tell us uh, the first one I read? You reserved it for um, a talk about the Maker Fair from last month. After that, uh, I already have two signed up for the show and tells. So if anybody has a show and tell, let me know so I can add you to the list. If you are online, uh, send me a message on the chat and I will add you. And so welcome everybody. This is the September meeting of the Robotic Society of Southern California. Mm -hmm. October. <laughs> With that September meeting. <laughs> October. All right. Alan, you ready? Yeah. Okay, I'm right here. Let me go ahead and share my, my screen. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, for um, any of you that have worked on cool stuff and wanted to set up a user interface for it, um, I've been in this position a lot. And for a lot of my work in Ross and, and prior to um, a few months ago, um, whenever I had to slap together a GUI or a graphical user interface or a UI, I would resort to uh, Python and PyQt and uh, Qt5 Designer. And it was a really easy way to set up a, a WYSIWYG interface and then instantiate it from within Python and connect to the controls and, and do fun stuff. And you saw me use this in previous months when I was toying with um, GPTJ and some of the other large language models. And, and, it, and it worked. I'm not going to bag on it too much. But um, it's a lot less flexible and it doesn't have any of the niceties of a modern web interface. Now, I, I love myself some modern web, but I just can't wrap my head around coding for it from React.js and all the different toolkits that they use. I, I, I just, that's not where my passion lies. I want to do cool stuff with robotics and slap together a graphical user interface to be able to use it without spending weeks and weeks and weeks trying it. So um, in one of my last talks, you um, may have noticed that I was actually I had used the web interface. Um, let me go ahead and pull it up really quick. Uh, my screen or not the screen that we're presenting on. Um, let's see. Uh, And I'm just going to bring it up. We're not going to uh, use it. But uh, when I was, uh, like everyone else, when I want to solve a problem by Google first, I came across uh, this toolkit called Streamlit. And it seemed to have everything uh, that I needed. So uh, this was the UI that I created, called it text thingy, that allowed me to control the parameters and pass text back, uh, back and forth um, with uh, this one was set up for GPT-3, I had one set up for GPT-J, and the whole thing just worked. It only took me about a half an hour to set up. Uh, so, uh, in, instead of reading through the manual in a, in a really boring way and boring you to tears, let's start with a problem we uh, may want to solve. I've got some extra stuff up here. And so the problem we're going to solve today is I want to use BlenderBot. Uh, BlenderBot's a Facebook project. Um, it's a large language model, similar to GPT-3 and some of the other ones. Um, uh, however, there are a few differences. This one was trained primarily on a corpus of chat conversations. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge baked into it, but its main reason to be is a back and forth chat conversation. Uh, BlenderBot 2.0 and now 3.0. Um, they're supporting this feature called long-term memory, where it tends to extrapolate similar statements from the things that you say and it says, and it commits it to memory, and it's supposed to use these to provide more contextually relevant responses. And uh, it's also supposed to search the internet. If you're asking a question and it doesn't have a great answer, it's supposed to bounce a query off of Google, let's say, and bring that back. Um, so it's a super cool concept in practice. Um, I'm working with Dr. Bruce. It's not really any more or less accurate or truthier than a pure la a large language model, but it's a step in the right direction. Now, I want to use this. And so um, from previous talks, I remember 
that the clearinghouse for all things large language model is Hugging Face. Uh, Hugging Face is a transformer and a community that has the tools and it hosts all the models to, to all kinds of fun stuff. So a quick Google search for Hugging Face Blunderbot um, brings me to this page. Um, it talks a little about what it is, where it came from, and by scrolling down, I notice that I've got some code. So like any good Google medicine, let me go ahead and copy that. And uh, paste that in. Um, and so what's great about Hugging Face is this is all of the setup. You import a couple of um, modules. Um, you instantiate the large language model and another uh, piece called a tokenizer that converts English text into a series of tokens or numbers. You send that input text to the model and you get back um, something in response. And so just copying and pasting this, uh, so bbblenderbot.py, the utterance is my friends are cool, but they eat too many carbs. I'm going to change that to tacos just because I think it's funny. It tokenizes it. It sends it to, um, it sends it to the model and then the model sends back some responses. Now I'm running this on my laptop. My laptop does not have a powerful graphics card on it. Um, so this is going to take a minute. It's going to take a minute to, uh, to instantiate the model. So I'm just going to add in some debugging print statements to see how long it takes. And uh, I, uh, I want to see how long it takes to load the, the tokenizer. The, um, the utterance shouldn't take very long. Uh, let's see, print. So when you're um, instrumenting code or you're putting these things in, you can get date and time stamp or you know time stamps mm -hmm. as well and do some time calculations. We're gonna do it the poor man's way. I just want to print something out as it as it starts the next session. Um, organizing input. Tokenizer, and then finally, the very response. All right, so now we have kind of, as we watch this thing run, we'll get a feel for roughly how long each piece takes. Um, let's see, we'll go ahead and hit save, go back to our trusty, um, our trusty prompt. I'm going to move my things out of the way here. Python db .py. And assuming I didn't mess anything up, um, it, it takes a minute to load, second to load up the interpreter, load model, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six one thousand. So six seconds to load the model into my not super powerful laptop. Um, we have a warning about something. We'll not worry about it too much. And then the actual generating response took about two seconds, right? Now, and, and this is a very simple model, 400 million parameter model running on my laptop. The fun models go for 7 billion, 20 billion you can reasonably run on a home computer, all the way up to GPT-3. Wonderbot 3, which uses 175 billion parameters, and at that point you're in the cloud. But you can see there's a certain amount of time that it takes for each of these pieces to run. That's going to be important a little bit later. So going back to our thing, um, our our response was, tacos are my favorite food. I can make a meal if I want to. Awesome. Um, so let's go back and and like anyone who's playing with a new model, we'll change the utterance. And then you hit save, and then you run it again, right? So this is all getting used to a code base 101. And then six seconds for the model, and so there's a pretty there's a pretty long turnaround time every time I want to throw something at it. 
right? And you know, you'll do this about six or eight or ten times. You're like, yeah, I wish there was a better way. Um, and apparently, a joke is, what do you call a robot that can't talk? And it's a robot that's machine that can write a text. This is a smaller, <laughs> large language model, but it's it, it, for demonstration purposes, it, it suits our purposes really well. Tell us things. So you know, okay. So now there's a part that takes long, and then we're running it. So let's make this a little bit smarter. We'll put the um, we'll put the tokenizer uh, part in a loop. And then instead of a hard-coded utterance, we'll collect input. Um, we'll call this uh, oh, I put the colon in the wrong spot. We looked at the code. It's super awesome at pointing that stuff out before you hit compile. So now we've got a, a, a simple loop. We're going to load in all the background stuff once. And then we'll just loop through this collecting input and generating a response until we hit control C, right? This is just all building up to, because this is what you do when you get a new large language model. You want to play with it, you download it on the code. So we'll write again. So still six seconds, four seconds down to load the model. We'll just uh, recognizer. it out uh, and now <laughs> and so now our turnaround time and we can play with it now it's fun right so you get in and you fire stuff out at it and um, and and you're now you're cooking with gas um, and but at some point you're like I want to make this easier to use right so we've got we've got um, a good idea we know we want to do all the heavy lifting stuff once and then loop around and get top and input but we want to do it using a user interface. And this, so if this is a background, this is the problem we're going to solve for. Uh, this is where Streamlit comes in. Uh, the story behind Streamlit, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit, is there were data scientists that were doing really cool stuff with data. And they had a web team. And every time they did something new that was cool, they'd say, hey, web team, we've got this new cool thing. Can you code up a user interface so that we can take advantage of it? And, and they would do it. And you already know my opinion on web developer. It's, to me, it's a dark magic. I'm, there are people that love doing it, and God bless them. Uh, but it's, it's a lot. There's a lot of pieces, even with modern toolkits. And so being data scientists, um, they kind of got fed up with, the, with, with waiting. So they're like, you know what? I am going to write a, uh, yet another GUI toolkit where I can create a, a user interface really simply, and I don't have to wait for the web guys anymore. And so that's literally how Streamlit was born. And uh, for anything in the data sciences, something where it takes a while to collect the data, and then you want to iterate, you want to riff on it doing different things, this is exactly what it's made for. And oddly enough, it actually also works really well for large language models, because we have a part where we load in the model, and when I load the GPTJ 6 billion parameter model on my computer at home, it takes a good minute to load it into memory and transfer it to the GPU. Mm -hmm. uh, the 20V 20, the 20 one takes um, a little bit more than that. So anything that you can do to not go through that full loop every time um, is great. And Streamlit supports that out of the box. So um, if, uh, for anyone who wants to follow along and, and for posterity, um, I have a requirements text that describes all of the tools you have to have installed, either through Conda or, or in Python to make this work. Um, so you can do a pip install for each of these, or you know a pip, a pip install minus r requirements.txt. You need transformers, the Streamlit library, uh, Torch, Torch Vision, and Torch Audio. Uh, because this is my laptop and it doesn't have a graphics accelerator, it is loading up the CPU version of Torch because there's different versions. If you have a graphics mm -hmm. card, you definitely want to use the GPU accelerated version. Um, so in my requirements text, for the example uh, purposes of this, you know, the toy blender bot, 100 million model, CPU version, once all these are loaded, you're cooking with fire. Um, 
So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and erase everything that we did, but to make sure it worked. Yeah, I, I, um, uh, we're going to set up a new uh, Python script called demo.py, and right now it's empty. It's blank. So, after everything's installed, uh, what we're going to do, and in Linux it's a little bit easier. Streamlit is installed as a first class application, uh, but since we're not we're doing it in Windows, we'll uh, instantiate a Python minus M streamlit once everything's installed, and then run, and then demo.py. Empty file. It takes a minute for it to load up in the interpreter, and it sets up a mini web server, and then it'll pop open a web page, a user interface for our application. Right now it doesn't do anything, but it's a, it's a good start. All right, but a blank screen. Um, so how do you use it? Uh, no joke, it took me about 30 minutes of poking around to set up that earlier UI. Um, and so let's go through really quick and, um, and get it set up. Blah, blah, blah. Read it out. Uh, one of the main things is the streamlit library needs to be imported, and by convention, that's imported as ST. So we'll do a quick import. Streamlit. SD. And uh, looking into the library of cool stuff you can do. Uh, they have a rich set of objects, and um, they always put their, their super awesome stuff on top, so they're like an text elements, display elements. So if you've done any user interface work, the concepts will make sense. They've got some really advanced graphing, charting that they're very proud of. Um, for the purposes of this exercise, there's really a couple things that I want. I'm going to give it a title. And then I want an input box, and an output box, and a button right that says run the model. And I want to load up the model once so that I can iterate really, really quickly. So um, the first thing that I want is a title, so let me just do a quick search for title. Display title in text formatting, ST title, body, anchor, ST title is the title. Seems pretty straightforward. ST title, let's call this underbot demo with lots of station points because we're very proud of ourselves. So I'm going to type in that thing, uh, that statement, hit save. Now check this out. Back on, back in our demo, we have this little thing up top. Uh, it notices that the source file is updated. I can rerun it, or I can always rerun it. I'm going to click on always rerun. That seems kind of handy. And uh, as soon as I hit save, the web page is all um, going to automatically update. As soon as I hit save, super speed, right? Okay, so this this is cool, right? Um, is we can iterate on our user interface and everything. It automatically updates, and if we mess something up. You get the error message right up there, right? So, okay, all right, I, I'm I'm down with this, right? So we can move almost as quickly as we can look up components and then and then tie it into the input. So, uh, we want a couple of other pieces. We want a, a text box or a text element of some sort. down, scroll, 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 input widgets. All right, so we want a button. What does that look like? Click equal best key button, click me. That seems pretty straightforward. We want a, uh, a text input or a text area input. So if it's a single line text input, if you want to take in more than one line text area, text underscore input and button. All right, so let's go ahead and fix that. And then 
stu.text input. We'll go to a piece and then um, button equals stu.button. Submit. And as soon as we hit save, there we go. All right, so we'll do um, one more piece. I want to. I want a little cubby hole for the um, outfit. And uh, you'll notice in Visual Studio Code, uh, once the library is loaded, um, you have pop-up help that tells you all about the command. So if you're not already coding in Visual Studio Code, this is really where you want to call home. It, there's just so many awesome things about it that uh, I can't really imagine doing this without it. So now we've got three. We've got our input, and then we've got our response. I didn't put a label on it. Let's put a uh, response in here. And uh, we'll go back. I'd originally tried to get these things side by side, but it was kind of hard to. So let's try it. Let's see if that'll work. Um, go ahead and minimize this piece. Okay. So now we've got our, our user interface. Let's put let's put these two things together. And in order to do that, there's two things that we need. We need to call something when the button's pressed. And in order to do that, we'll go back over to our button. Here, let's re-maximize this. And we've got a on-click. So on-click. Um, Let's call the submit function. Uh, we don't have a submit function yet, so let's create a submit function. We'll put something in here. Um, uh, notice we still have an error. Uh, if you're if you're really good at Python, this is a no-brainer. But if you're if you dabble like me, you're like, why am I getting an error for submit? It's defined down here. Uh, scripts are evaluated from the top down. Mm -hmm. And one of the quirks and one of the superpowers of Streamlit is that every time you submit an input on the form, it reruns the script, which will inform you about some ways that you need to approach that. But again, we're just a couple of web searches that got a UI on here. So let's go ahead and take our define function, our submit function, mm -hmm. and we'll, um, we'll move it up top somewhere. All right. Um, and because I like... Uh, because I like, got it. Okay. <laughs> I like to iterate slowly because if you're anything, you're probably way smarter than I am. But if I do too many things at once, one of them goes wrong, and I spend the last half hour figuring out which one it is. So um, I want to verify that when I click on the submit button, that this function runs. So I've got this little little debugging statement: submit pressed. Let's go ahead and move that back over here. There we go. All right, so we'll hit save. And we'll move this back over here. So if I click on submit, submit pressed. All right. And we're just going to continue iterating through. So now I've got a submit button. Let's take all of that code that we did, and except that let's get rid of the let's get rid of the, the loop. <laughs> the address to do right. So this was the this was the. Um, the code that we ran from the other one. Let's go ahead and stick that whole thing into the submit statement. And then we'll fix our, we'll fix our, um, our tabs. And we've got a few imports missing, so we'll add those in. I'll go away. 
resave. And so now that I reran it, now it's loading all that stuff in the background. And when we hit submit trust, we're kind of where we were in the beginning. We're loading in six seconds, pumping measure. Updated and, and, and we're done. Okay. But we can do better than this. So there are a couple of things that we want to do. And we want to first off, we want the input to be from, from the input and we want to put the output in the output, right? So we're going to add in a key. We're going to say, hey, whatever's stored in the input, it'll be stored in the input key. And whatever is on the output, output a response. And I want that utterance to be equal to grab whatever was typed in, whatever was stored. In the value input. Hmm. That's what the keys are. Mm -hmm. um, so all of this is in the all of this is in the docs. I'm just I'm just skipping a step. Um, and instead of looking it up, I'm just going to type it in. And when we're done, I want to set the uh, for the output. I want to set that equal to the uh, the output from the uh, detail connector. So let me separate this out. Um, I'm going to separate out that response. I'll put it in a variable called response. I'll then print response. And I'll set it equal to the response. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I did everything right, there's no guarantee. Um, at least every time we iterate, it's going to take the input from the input field and spit the output back in the output. Uh, if you're like me, you're already a little bit irritated that it's taking 10 seconds when you know if you do it in less. Oh. Okay, so I have an error. Oh, do you see it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, it's perfect. It's be perfect. Night. There's a little trick because it, um, a little Python stuff, you can't just do a tokenize. Um, it's a list that's being converted into a text. Mm -hmm. And so the, the internet said, if I did it this way, <laughs> they're joining that it would work. Yeah, so it's, uh, there's a, uh, that, that, that appends the uh, the contents of the list into a oh, right. string. <gasps> um, all right, so let's try that again. So we're we're most of the way there, right? So we've connected the UI back to the code, but now every time we do it, we're loading up the whole model. There's a few more tricks that we're going to employ so that when we first run it, it loads up the model once. Mm -hmm. And then from that point forward, you can iterate on the UI as often as you want. And it'll keep a copy of that loaded model in the background um, so that you can have more fun and less time waiting. All right. 
So there's there's a couple of tricks that we're going to do. And one of them is we're going to separate out the model loading and the tokenizer loading into a function that returns uh, a reference to the model. So uh, get model. And so we're going to grab all of this and move it over to a function. And I'll show you why in just a second. And that function returns the model. And the same thing for the tokenizer. Get tokenizer. We're going to grab that. <laughs> yeah, I'm running. I'm running at a at a uh, larger magnification, so that it's easier to read on the screen. Um, but that also means that the helpful pop up help takes up three quarters of the screen whenever it pops up. All right, and so we're going to return the tokenizer, and because I like to do things one step at a time, I'm going to replace where we originally called it with a call to our new function to make sure I didn't mess anything up. And this is all because I'm not great at Python, so I usually do things one step at a time. Um, so we'll say model, and then we'll call our new get model function that returns the model instead. Tokenizer. Get tokenizer, and so from that point forward, everything should still run. And I hit save, do a refresh, it goes through it once. About 10 seconds. Submit. And as long as we get a good return, we know we're on the right track. We know that our functions are doing what they're supposed to be. And we haven't broken anything by separating it out into uh, awesome. This guy's already on my one of my favorites. You know what? You love robotics, I love you. Okay. <laughs> so for the, the last bit of magic to work under Streamlit and give the Streamlit application the ability to cache the model and the tokenizer, uh, they have a way of doing that. And I'll show you that's somewhere over here. And the way we're going to do that is by telling it to cache the output of the function. And we do that with a decorator. Hmm. Uh, called stcache. And the whole thing's pretty smart. Um, it knows that the first time it runs it, with a certain amount of input, it'll cache the results of that, whatever that result is. And then you can um, you can call that um, every time the script relaunches, right? Because every time you click on return or enter, you have a slider bar. The whole script reruns top to bottom. This is your way of saying, hey, hold on to the result of this. And for a data scientist, like if you're working with a huge data set, data set just imagine how awesome this is. And it's also a pretty awesome large language model because it is, in essence, a large data set, right? So let's try this. ST cache. We don't have any squigglies. Let's go ahead and hit save. And uh, go back to our demo. And let's see what happens. So you, you put it on the function, but not the variable. See, I would have thought you uh, cache this variable. Yeah. Because that's what if you called it two times? Yeah, it's, it would be a good thing to explore. Yeah, it's, uh, so I, I called it for the output of each one, and it would be a good thing to explore. I, I'm not an expert on Streamlit by any means, but I can follow directions. So um, it would be interesting to see if it could be applied in other areas as well. Um, but uh, according to their documentation, when you want to store the results of a data set, if you wrap the cache decorator around the function that returns that data set, it knows what to do. Mm. But yeah, we're just touching the surface on, on all the cool stuff. So yeah, you called it twice. And 
maybe cache two different things. It caches once for each function. The decorator applies to each function. Yeah. No, I meant in, in, in the, when you actually call the function in your code, you call it two different times with two different variables, and then you needed those variables later to so cache all of them. You know. Yeah, it would be a good thing. It would be a good you know what I'm trying out. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So if I did things right, it shouldn't have to load the model again. So let's uh, do our little split screen here. Let's see what we can see. All right, so the first time I hit submit, it's running it. Ooh, okay. And we have an error. Now, this one threw me for a loop for a few minutes. I'm like, I'm following the directions. The directions talk about a data set isn't, isn't a language model letting more from a data set, and it turns out that it is a little bit different from a data set. So um, you'll do a little bit of Googling with the error message, and uh, Torch is in there, or PyTorch. And what you'll find out is that you have to add a parameter to the decorator, the cache, to tell it how to handle this particular type of caching. And that and that decorator is, drum roll please, allow output mutation equals true. Ooh. Now this is, well, yeah, no, yeah, I'm not saying this makes sense, so, uh, but uh, other people have ran into it, they're set up to handle it, and so a Google search would be error message, and this will come up, right, uh, either in their forms or somewhere else. Yeah, this is not something that I, that you can pull out of, you know, out of your pocket, but when, uh, we're not the only ones to run into it, this is a great fit for large language models, and someone, again, way smarter than me has already figured this out and solved it. And so we'll do the, we'll try the same thing. All right, so now, well, let's see. Hit refresh, we have an updated demo. And so the first time I run it, it is going to go through and load up the model in the background. So loading model, loading tokenizer, And we have a response. Okay, so we don't have any errors now. To uh, <laughs> right? so to to wrap this up, let's see let's see what happens when we type in statement number two. So we'll watch over here on left versus right. We'll hit submit. So yeah, so we didn't have a loading tokenizer nor a loading model, and so now we can play with it, we can um, add on to it, uh, add in parameters without the overhead of loading in the model and tokenizer every time. Does um, does it remember previous computations? You know, that's the claim from Facebook about the Blenderbot uh, versions two and three, uh, and when I use their they're online. They have an online version you can you can hit. Um, you need a Facebook account? Uh, for uh, for the the Blenderbot demo? No. Um, <laughs> and when you go through here, it actually gives you hints in the UI that shows what things it stored and what things it refers to. So their online version of three, I know, does it. Online. I'm having a hard time finding evidence that oh, actually cool. I've I've looked in the source code um, for Blenderbot and I can see where it is storing and retrieving, but I can't find any evidence that it's hitting the web on it. But I, I, they wouldn't lie about it. It's got to be in there. Mm -hmm. So between like using their Parl AI version or their Blenderbot version, that I'm not sure. Um, but I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping it does. Um, I actually haven't done a lot of work with Blenderbot as opposed to GPTJ, which I'm a lot. I wouldn't call it fluent, but I, I know how to how to harangue a little bit better. But yeah, in theory, it should be starting up a session and then storing that in memory. So like you said, my favorite animal is dogs or whatever. And then later you were like, do you remember when I told you what my favorite animal was or something? Yes, it should be right to be able to it's it's that. supposed to. Um, mm -hmm. However, in my experience, comparing the output from 
um, the GPTJ style, where you feed in the entire conversation mm -hmm. in short-term memory, mm -hmm. and the Blenderbot model, where it's supposed to remember it. Um, when I was having extended conversations with Blenderbot online, because that's how I roll, um, every time I'd log in, it stores everything, all that in, in uh, like a local cache, and mm -hmm. it'll show you um, everything that it's learned about the conversation. And so, you know, I tell it, I have three, I have two dogs, God, I have mm. three, uh, two dogs, their names are Jack and Gracie, they are great names, I love them very much, so those are the things that are in there. And so I start the conversation, and with a question, how many dogs do I have, right? And it would, it, it would invariably get it wrong. Uh, although it's a step in the right direction, it's not, like the, the distance between storing information and thought and actual in, in inference, of the, of the data, it wasn't quite there yet. However, one day when I started up a, a chat session where it kept from the previous ones, including my love of um, Jack and Gracie, the first thing out of its mouth was, so, how are Jack and Gracie doing? Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, okay, so when it works, right? Like, okay, you know, I, I'm on now, but it's not at a point where you can tell it facts and have and ask mm -hmm. questions about those facts and it responds. It's basically conversational, um, no more or less truthy, but the but the approach makes mm -hmm. sense. Like they're they're on the right track. Like um, a hybrid model of a deep learning model and some type of a data store and internet. Like that feels like where things are going to go next. Uh, but mm -hmm. even in Blunderbot three, 175 billion parameter model. It's not at a point where you can tell it interesting things about you and then ask questions and have the responses in relation. As opposed to GPT-3 with you know short-term memory where you pass in the entire conversation. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, it, it applied, it, it's able to infer from that context what you're looking for. So you can tell it a story about you know the three little wolves and, and their names were you know Millie, Billy, and Tilly. And they'll ask what are the three names, and more often than not, it's able to get that out of the previous conversation. The Blunderbot short-term memory or long-term memory doesn't appear to work the same way. Um, what about the internet? Uh, is it reaching into the internet? Can I ask it how hot it is in Long Beach today, and it'll reach out and bring that fact back? Hmm. Uh, yeah, here, let's give it a. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the Dr. Bruce example that we were playing with was um, how many satellites are in orbit around the Earth. Now, the last couple times that we've done that, it's come back with an answer. Um, it's also thinking a little bit more than normal. I think it's okay. So here we have an interesting response. It is factually correct. And depending on how you phrase it and how it phrases the response, sometimes it'll give you a more general, there are 3,000 satellites, which is less accurate. Uh, and what's nice about this interface, which is free to everyone, let me just go ahead and put the link in the chat for anyone who wants to play around with it. It, it really is a step in the right direction. Uh, chat. There we go. Uh, uh, in, in this interface, it's it's able to it gives you a catalog of uh, things that it looks up and things that um, it remembers. Uh, it looks like long-term memory is showing is what shows up when you click on uh, memory. So we'll click on this message, and this is the result of the search. For whatever reason, every time we ask it how many satellites are in orbit, it comes back with this Starlink data <laughs> Starlink data point. Um, so again, not not perfect or even accurate in most means, but this is like the first four, like GPT-1 versus where we're at now. Um, it can only get better, and a large language model that can improve its truthiness from searching the internet and keeps a memory of your conversation and is able to base responses on that definitely feels like you're getting closer than a static large language model whose only memory of your interaction is the history of your conversation that you pass in as tokenized input. Which again, is still super impressive. Uh, but yeah, so it, it, it will search. Uh, if I tell things like I have uh, two great things, I'm telling it something. It's uh, 
Can I chew on that for a minute? <laughs> and you know what? The the first two responses are spot on. <laughs> 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 and if we check memory, I have two great names. Right? But if I go back and I ask, How many do I have? In previous ex experiments, it has been able to tie the fact from long term memory into uh, the question. So it's not, it's not able to leverage the long term memory interrogatively hmm. so far. So that was a hard question. Could you just ask what kind of dog you have? Oh, yeah, because I was like accumulating this I said this may be a number. What kind? It'd be nice to your... So this is not like an account based thing, you don't have to yeah, log this in. Is, this isn't as good as a prologue program I could write <laughs> myself. <laughs> just oh, that's for interesting. The, so we didn't repeat. say that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 so somebody yeah. knows it. Like it's right. in the it's ballpark. Been, yeah. yeah. It's already yeah. over every time. Yeah, th this one is, it, it's kind of dumb in that sense. It can't, mm -hmm. it can't quite. It, it would yeah. be cool if you could have an account based one where you log in with your profile and it remembers you every time you go back in. Mm -hmm. your, your own conversation. That would be neat. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, and yeah. if, um, so I've got the link in chat. If this is something I definitely recommend playing with, at least so you can have a, a feel for what the state of the art is. So Facebook Meta, this is one of their versions of a large writing planning model. Uh, but um, if you exit out of the window and then go back to it the next day, um, I think they're using cookies or a local data store, or, or maybe it's just based on a unique idea on the server. It'll, it'll remember. So it does. Uh, yeah, yeah, from from one session to the next. So okay. as you log back in over days, it'll start cataloging more and more information. You can also you. just pop into your Facebook account and remember all your right, all, 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 all right? your stories, all your albums, <laughs> everything you've ever done. <laughs> everything you ever done. Do that. Be like, oh, I see you lost your, I see you lost one of your dogs three years ago. Are you sad? No. <laughs> <laughs> like Facebook memories. It's like here's the picture that was looking at your photos. Yeah. I see your status has changed. <laughs> yeah, right. So so just to, uh, to to wrap up when the AI part of this talk, or your personal uh, yeah. especially if you're working on things wow. involving data <laughs> and large language models, um, yeah, Streamlit I mean, might be the tool that, that you want to use. Uh, with a with a um, a simple in install of Streamlit that gives you access to the library. The uh, the documentation is thorough. Uh, the the use of it is really really simple. Now, if, if you've got it in your heart of hearts for a very specific user interface, with this isn't going to be it for you. This is a way for uh, people who just want to set up the user interface and first get out of the way to set up something quickly with um, with enough tools and widgets in it to get you from point A to point B. Uh, once you launch it, every time you hit save, the web interface is already all automatically updated. Um, in applications where like I'm calling GPT-3 through the cloud, which I was going to demo, but I didn't want to pay for an account. Um, after, the, after the trial expired, I'm like, ah, I don't want to spend 10 bucks on this. Um, where it doesn't matter, if every time you hit enter, it runs the script from top to bottom. When you're running things locally, like I'm running uh, Blenderbot 400 or one of the larger ones, and you want to cache that model setup so you don't have to wait a full minute, this has using an ST cache and a little bit of um, uh, decoration wizardry, um, allow output mutation, allows you to store that model in between runs so to, to increase your, uh, improve your iteration from one thing to the next. Uh, so it's it's a it's a great tool. I've, I've had a lot of luck with it. I've successfully demoed it for GPT prior and I'll continue to use it as um, as opportunities present themselves. Um, I'll include a, a link to Streamlit and, and some other stuff um, in the chat as well. Uh, but, but yeah, so that's what I've got on my side. Do you guys have any questions? Anything that um, uh, the application it is it is Python uh, again if you're running in Linux uh, Streamlit is supported as a as an application so you can run Steam, Streamlit run um, if you're doing it from uh, Windows or or in Linux if you choose 
It's uh, you read it from Python as a module, so Python minus m streamlit run, and then the name of your your Python file, and then everything else uh, everything else just works. Valid. Hmm? One of my favorite things is to put like an HTML interface on top of the robot, right? So I can do it with my phone. And so this probably could do that. Is that something you thought about, or this? It seems like it's not exactly the right technology, but it might work. Yeah, it, it depends on what type. And in, in in my experience, my opinion, it depends on what type of input that you're going to solicit. So if you want to throw up a web page that captures camera input and has sliders and you know like a status page, 100%. Um, it's it's set up for that, and it seems to be a perfect fit. The one part that you had mentioned in previous months was would it support like a joystick? Or something like that. It's not really set up for that. Um, when you are sliding around the um, uh, sliders, already closed the previous one. Every time you let go of the slider, that's when it sends the input, mm -hmm. right? So you let go of the slider, it refreshes the web page, provides the input for whatever else you're going to do. So I didn't, I didn't see or notice a way to support like a joystick, driver, touchpad type thing. Um, so in that case, it feels like a little bit less of a fit, but that certainly wouldn't keep me from trying. Because the rest of it is so easy and slick and straightforward. It's pretty close. It seems pretty close. Yeah. All, All right. Cool. I think, uh, yeah, personalized chatbot would probably be the future. Yeah. Where it ties to all your social media and pulls all the data and then remembers everything you ever did and comes back and asks you, hey, remember what you did? Still doing that? Yeah, I know what you did last summer. Yeah, yeah. No, there have uh, been no less than two Black Mirror episodes on the very same <laughs> side, oh, okay. as well as uh, a subplot point for season four of Westworld, I believe. Oh, <laughs> no. I gotta watch that. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> so yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Um, like I said, I'll continue to use it as as it fits, and and for me, it was a perfect fit for my doodlings and large language models. All right, thanks. Cool. Thank you. Huh? You're up, Jim. All right. Um, I, is that the that plug is not on? Do you want to you want to connect to the? Oh, oh you need power? Power. Yeah, when you uh, or you have the access to that. I think it's right, that one is this one. Let's see. On. Oh. One's on, this one's plugged in, and then plugged in, and then plugged in. I wasn't in. How about that? I see a light. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. So my talk, um, let's uh, share the screen here. Share my whole screen. So I'm Jim Denunzio, if you guys don't know me, software engineer at Samsung uh, Research America. And um, so today I'm going to uh, talk about the, uh, the work I've been getting involved with the metahumans. Uh, Dr. Bruce uh, and I both are. Uh, he first mentioned it as um, uh, he wanted the goal of being able to use his desktop chatbot, um, which is, you know, it has multi -level, it's a multi level chatbot uh, that can do queries on the internet and, um, and also hooks into GPT 3. So he would like a front end interface for that. Um, which would be a metahuman, an animated person. And so this is sort of the overall goal um, of uh, you know, this effort. And so looking in the, um, in the uh, world, what's going on now, the current uh, state of things, people have already done uh, this, uh, and it, but it's kind of cutting edge. It just sort of started you know, in the last few months seems like um, there are uh, facilities available, including NVIDIA is pushing, is announced a, 
a full solution to this that's coming out soon, but we don't know how much it's going to cost um, or if it'll be free. So uh, give you an idea. This is uh, this talk. I'm just going to start out with getting a metahuman, picking a metahuman, um, and I won't show the details of modifying it, but I'll allude to that with the, uh, the MetaHuman interface that's online. It's a web a web program. Uh, but once you get, uh, you know, what I want to, what I'll show you is how to bring it into Unreal Engine. Um, so there's some software you'll have to install to do all this. Unreal Engine is the big one. And uh, then from within Unreal Engine, there's, that's sort of the beginning of your journey, being able to animate the metahuman, make him talk, and ultimately make a chatbot that talks back to you and that you can talk to. So that's sort of the overarching goal. Um, so this is, a, here's a quick demo of um, the given, of, well, the first step is, uh, that I started with was lip sync. That was the first unknown piece. So uh, you have some audio, and you want to lip, you want to lip sync the model. Hello, my name is Cooper, and I am a metahuman. With some work, you can customize me and import me into Unreal Engine. Once I'm here, you can make me speak with realistic lip sync using the metahuman SDK. All right, Jim is going to show you how to get started. Have fun. Tell them Cooper. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this is Cooper. That's his name from the MetaHuman uh, website. And um, yeah, unfortunately, because of the delays in in video playing and everything, the lips aren't quite synced as as it, well as it is in real life when you're running it lo um, locally. And uh, ultimately, again, I, I, or I forgot to add in, once you do all this stuff with Unreal Engine. Uh, the ultimate goal would be to create an application out of Unreal Engine. You, you bake a program, an exe file for Windows. I don't know about other app, other OSs, but then that standalone exec, ex executable, well, with a direct, directory of files, that you then can run without Unreal Engine to do whatever it is you did. It's, it's like a program. Uh, I mean, it is a program, but you've used uh, Unreal Engine to uh, create that program and what they call blueprints or C programming. There's different ways. Blueprints are um, are actually a uh, uh, sort of a connect connecting a bunch of boxes together. It's sort of like blocky. I mean, it's a more it's a blocky for adults. <laughs> And the Unreal Engine, is, uh, so I recall, is a, a open source video gaming. Yeah, so game. Unreal Engine itself is um, free for you know everyone to use unless you make a million dollars or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a video game development system, but uh, it also can be a simulation development system. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, it develops a, an, an app that um, a pro you can develop a program with it that will. Um, uh, that will, you know, work in 3D, 3D graphics, animation, uh, and also any kind of plugins that you, that are available to interact with the the, uh, the outside of the um, of Unreal Engine. For instance, you need to access the internet. You need to call GPT-3. Uh, you need to go to up to a cloud service to get lip sync animation. All this stuff is possible. So it's a it's a platform, a framework. You can think of uh, in Unreal Engine as this framework for developing um, any any pur you know, any purpose application uh, that involves this animation and and um, and three D three D graphics. So um, yeah, so uh, this is the, the these are some of the steps you'll have to take. Um, to do it, and I'll show, I'll sort of go in and out of showing you actual um, the Unreal Engine running on my PC at home. It won't run, you know, on a laptop, you have to have a pretty beefy laptop and you want a good graphics card. So the Unreal Engine, you create an Epic Games account, um, 
you know, uh, install this the launcher, and then I'll make these all available. Uh, we don't have to go through all the details. But what this, the, through these steps, you'll be able, you'll be uh, installing Unreal, um, and you'll be uh, creating a new um, a new project. And uh, let's see, here we go. So creating an Unreal project. Um, you'll be creating a project. It's like any other software uh, that uh, you have projects that contain all of the stuff you're working on. And um, and then for what we're interested in is MetaHuman. Um, and uh, in Unreal they have this thing called the Quixel Bridge. And this will let you uh, start the process of creating a MetaHuman. The MetaHuman uh, create online with this, uh, the MetaHuman Creator. It's a web-based interface, and uh, which is pretty cool. Um, it runs. It it uh, it's fully 3D graphics, and it is uh, it's just a web and it's a web app, and it's pretty um, and it lets you choose uh, all the details of your MetaHuman. And let's see if I, I don't know if we'll have to see if it runs uh, will run well on this um, my laptop here. So not here we go. You do, yeah, need an account. Um, uh, one of some account, some account that you would use uh, for uh, to use the MetaHuman interface. Not used to this. Um, yeah, let's just do it a different way. This keyboard is. Try that again. So. So this is, yeah, it's going to be slow, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure to try to optimize for video. I like the... Oh, yeah. let's make sure we do that. Yeah. Okay. Have an account that you do all this. You should be able to do it this time. Yeah. That's long. <laughs> it's just two fingers, but we know it's not. Yeah. Yeah, it's all it's a long password. Oh boy. <laughs> That must be a problem somehow. Let's just try to Google. Google 
to to the connected already. Oh, well, this isn't working. All right. Um, yeah, if you're already up, maybe uh, Ben can share a screen for a minute. You can walk through the creator portion of it. I'm not sure why it's sending you through the RAM. Sometimes you have to reply for you. Wow. Um, I don't think they want you to connect today, bro. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. You want to use All right, Jim? Yeah. All right, forget this. So. Um, anyway, well, it's not that important, but um, you, uh, I mean, this is a full interface that you use. It's to uh, create your meta, meta human. And I'll probably just show from the, from yeah. the other side. Yeah. Yeah, um, here. Um, let's just, because uh, I have, I have it on my other machine anyway. All right. So, um, yeah, if you just want to walk through, like, it's not your model, but. Yeah, there you go. That's, I just wanted to mention how you, um, that you can, uh, well, I, I was just going to show the, or the opening screen, really, not all this. The, uh, you can um, choose from a bunch of possible metahumans. I'm there if you want to finish your name. Oh, I see. Okay. Looks like it's having a couple of little busy today. Under, Everything is meta. Oh, the page? Meta. Yeah. Right. yeah, well then it's a whole meta company, yeah, meta. Well, that's like Metaverse. Like Kitty Cloud. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you gonna show? Yeah. Maybe it'll. I'm sure it's not. Is the one you wanted to show? Yeah, uh, just the. Uh, You'll have this interface, and I actually can show it from the, uh, well, uh, this is the interface to the, the MetaHuman Creator, and you'll be able to click on any of the um, people that you uh, want to work with, and um, you can modify them. That's a whole other, and that's up to you. I'm not you know, going to get into uh, the modifications, but you can craft, you can sculpt the MetaHuman to be to look exactly as you uh, as you desire, uh, and, this. and then uh, after that we're going to import. Um, here's the there. So So if I yeah. So that's can you stop sharing? yeah. You can stop sharing. I'll show. Um, Um, okay, I have to go back. Yeah. See here, I'm in, okay, I'm going to switch over to Unreal on my computer at home. Um, if you click, uh, this is the Quixel Bridge, which is a plugin that comes with Unreal 5. And um, you'll see it. Uh, in the menus here, um, just I think it's in here, Pixel Bridge under the Windows. And you, you open that, um, and then there's a button for MetaHumans. And so this. Uh, Good question, Jim. Yeah. Uh, is it only available in version 5? Or Yeah, the, the is bridge like is only available here in 5. Or is five uh, enough in higher? Or what version of it is it in higher? Well, five is the current version. Okay. So here, what you're seeing here is the kind of equivalent, or this is the quick interface to um, or to importing the metahuman directly into Unreal. Uh, if you're working with, I, I recommend five you now at this point, uh, uh, Unreal five, because all the, the latest tools that I'm working with just switched over to five. And um, the, you can still do it in 4.27 uh, as well, but you don't have access to these great tools that I'm showing. Gotcha. So, and the what they've done is in five they've built in this thing called the pixel bridge, and that allows 
working um, importing the metahuman directly from within Unreal. So from within Unreal, you can click on um, the metahuman you're interested in, and it's so hard to work with a small screen. And then, um, yeah, you, you pick one here, and then you can uh, actually import. Um, a lot to choose from. Okay, I docked that by mistake. And from within here, uh, I'm going to show you the other side. It doesn't seem to be shy. So from within here, you can you uh, you can select one, and then you'll click the download button. There's a right side of the screen I can't seem to get to, um, but there's uh, there's a download button, and then once downloading will take a little time, and then uh, then there's a add button, and that's the the uh, the button you'll be work you'll be pressing on this page to add the metahuman. It takes a, a long time to do that. Um, let's go back to my slideshow. So you'll be uh, through this interface, through that pixel bridge, you can add a metahuman. And I'll, I'll, again, I'll share all this. Um, you'll want to pick a metahuman that uh, I recommend picking one that's uh, without this warning that it says is, you know, it requires a, um, you know, the highest power um, video card. So you want to check check that in the MetaHuman creator. Uh, so the bridge, you could, from that bridge, you could launch into the creator and uh, and then and from the and then come back. And then from the bridge, you will uh, that's where you'll um, import. So that this is a uh, Kind of a quick overview of how you download. You, you, there'll be a button for download. It can take 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, then you click the add button. That'll take a really long time <laughs> uh, for the first one, especially. Um, and uh, you have to, you'll get warning. It's kind of a dog to go through, but you, you know, you see warning messages. You just have to say you have to click enable missing dial and enable the missing plugins. So I mean, you could read this, um, uh, you know, offline. And yeah, you'll see messages like, um, like missing plugins. And then, um, yeah, you'll be restarting your MetaHuman, or you're restarting UE5, and uh, this will take a long time uh, to compile all the shaders. So it's an hour to cook up to an hour. Although you, you can start using it quicker than that. That's just when it will be finished and looking beautiful. Um, and so ultimately you'll get a, uh, a new directory of um, objects here. And, and you'll see here it says Cooper. And uh, that then you can add you can add Cooper to the scene of a of your level. And this is kind of what a, um, when you add, you drag in uh, your metahuman into the scene. Um, and that's what I've done. This is the real Unreal Engine running. So you'll be creating a new level. And there's, I mean, you have to, the software takes some time uh, to learn, but there's, there's tutorials all over the place. Uh, but really, all you have to do is go to this new level button. And um, once you've done that import, then uh, you'll have a, there'll be a directory uh, called MetaHuman in the content, it's called the content browser. And uh, under MetaHuman will be your Cooper. I also have one called uh, Kyoko. And so you can see, after a while, you'll see a picture of the, after it compiles all the shaders and does all this, you'll see a picture of the guy in there. Uh, but before even that, you'll be able to drag this 
um, into the scenes. And you drag that into the scene. I won't try to do it now over the internet. And then, uh, you, then your metahuman is in your scene. And uh, that's how you start working with those. Um, So the, the metahuman is a photorealistic um, 3D uh, model with all the associated skin tones, uh, hair, everything, clothing, of course. It takes a long time and a lot of processing to make that photo real and um, to get it in your Unreal Engine and fully compiled. Uh, so that's why you need a good video card to really work with this. I don't have an excellent video card. Mine's like a, um, a GeForce, uh, uh, I think a 2070 or something. I a couple, a $400 one from a few years ago, but that works reasonably well. But my PC is about the oldest. It's like a, it's kind of getting old now, my PC. Uh, I highly recommend a lot of memory and, um, uh, and a good a good graphics card, um, and then you'll be able to. But you know you'll be able to work with it faster and, yeah. and easier. But it, in my case, it's it's doable, it's workable. Can you do just the head, or does it have to have a body? Uh, well, the metahuman you could probably do. Um, you, I mean, when you bring in the, I mean, the head is the most complicated part anyway. All the shaders for the eyes and the hair and everything, um, but yeah, you, the rest of the body probably isn't taking as much. But you yeah. could probably do that. I was thinking if you want to use it on a, on a robot. Okay. Yeah, have, that's so. true. I mean, I just do a tight crop can, in. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you just crop it in with Unreal Engine? Yeah, you can crop mm -hmm. it, and then you won't even just see it, and it won't yeah. see the body. Well, we can um, zoom into the. Yeah, you can zoom in. Oh, yeah, that's what I've done um, in my, you'll see, uh, back here in this, uh, or in the video. I'll show you a video. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the interface is a little, I had it like lined up. But yeah, Unreal Engine, it has a, a, a camera that you can position wherever you want and zoom yeah. into whatever you want. Wow, so like multiple cameras, mm -hmm. wherever you want. Exactly, yeah. And so, um, like I had this center before, but anyway, you can yeah, you can you can switch the sun or you know, maybe multiple suns, whatever you want, a uh, different uh, lighting. Yeah, you can do um. There's a lot you can do uh, with you know you can yeah you can see I'm just this is terrible because it's over the internet but uh, you can get exactly the the um, crop that you want and uh, and then you can. Uh, create movies from that. You can, uh, and then you can obviously run your program ultimately for whatever it's doing. Um, so let's go to, let's see if I have. Uh, so here, this is. Um, so here I've got it. There's a, this is, let's jump ahead to what I've been able to achieve. Um, so far with this, uh, what you can what you can do is find a body animation and facial animations in other examples, uh, you know, pr example projects uh, that are on the internet. Um, so here I have I've imported the metahuman, uh, put it in the level. I've assigned an animation to the body, and um, and actually this one's going to talk. Uh, with something I think I gave it here. To, um, I've got a body animation linked in with the, uh, the lip sync, so this looks much more realistic. More a way, uh, a way, a way to a more um, uh, useful uh, avatar. Hello. Hello. My name, my is, name is Cooper, and I am and a metahuman. Meta -human. -human. With some work, With some work you, can you can customize me and import me into Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine. 
Once I'm here, you can make me speak with realistic lip sync using the MetaHuman SDK. Alright, Jim is going to show you how to get started. Have fun. So you saw that one before. The first one I showed you was just the, you know, just the lips, just the lips alone, and it, it, it you know, it, it's quick. You, you quickly find that you're, yourself not, not, you know, wanting to see more and better animation uh, for your chatbot, or, uh, and it gets kind of hard rather quickly because uh, body animation, all that has to be done by hand, and. Um, but anyway, there there are some enough like idle they call idle animations, facial and body, probably out there. This is just one you just saw that um, that are are good for this purpose. And here's another I'll show you from the um, a female that I brought in. Uh, Hi. So here is an example of uh, a metahuman with a uh, an idle animation that I found. So this is an idle animation. I mean, we can't hear my audio in here, but... And I just figured out how to combine them without uh, the body, the head coming off the body. So what you can do is there's a body animation as well as a head, and you have to combine them uh, through this blend pose system. Uh, I just found an example, but... Uh, again, this is where it looks this like. This could be the, uh, you know, the beginning of what you'd have for when it's an uh, an avatar chatbot. Um, so this is a um, just a fully animated character instead of uh, by hand. And what you can do, though, uh, is through some sync. manipulation, you can Override keep the body the animation sync. and keep and the head. Animation, but change the lip sync essentially, so it's, it can be blended. So you can hand essentially use and what someone else has hand animated, and then just replace the lip sync, which is the part you want to um, you want to animate with your language or whatever you want to say. Uh, of the lips. So this is that's that. um, unfortunately, like yeah, when I misconfigured this. You miss, uh, the head pops off the body. <laughs> and it goes like that, and, and it starts talking, but it's no longer part of the body. The body's moving. So, I, yeah, it's uh, there's some there's some uh, uncanny valley situations, and not just Thomas that has that problem. It's also in the virtual world. <laughs> um, so. What's what I'm using to do a lot of this? Um, once you've got the metahuman uh, into the system, then you need uh, some plugin assistance to do more advanced things. Because I mean, I, I'm not an animator. Um, what you saw there was someone else's animation, and then with lip sync, it's an uh, it's a automated process that uh, that um, I've employed. And uh, so, as not as a non-animator, I would be taking advantage of other people's animations uh, or an automated system. But it's a big challenge because you open up, you bring in your metahuman into the system, and you've just got this, you know, this stationary human in this pose, and there's nothing moving, and it's a lot of work to make that thing into something reasonable. A lot of animation. Uh, or you can you can find a few types of animations, or you can purchase them online. There's a whole world of that. You can buy animations. Some are free, uh, but then you'll have to. Uh, some of that one I showed you was already for a metahuman. I just copied it from another metahuman project. But uh, most of the animations are out there that you can buy. They may not be for a metahuman. You have to go through some procedure of to uh, what they call is re remap them um, to the your metahuman skeleton essentially. But uh, so that's a sort of a side thing. Um, what I'm interested in what, to make it look realistic, you need that. But I can't. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to cover much of that other than what I just showed you. But what I am covering is the ability to make it lip sync, and that's the primary. Um, 
goal that I'm seeking out here. And to do that, this MetaHuman SDK plugin, which is free and can be installed, it is the cutting edge right now. It can turn recorded voice audio into lip sync animation. And it's only in a beta and it's only good in the development mode, but it does the trick. So in his details, I'll share this later. And unfortunately, currently, if you do these steps, you have to have a visual studio to compile it, but which it compiles automatically through the app, through Unreal. But what I might do is put up the pre-compiled binaries on the internet for people to download. And assuming you have a regular Windows PC, then X86, then that will work. But if that would help people, I could do that. It might save time because not everybody wants to install this. You could also wait until a release comes out because right now it's in this beta stage. This late breaking beta was really a big improvement over the current release of the MetaHuman SDK plugin. You can do lip sync animation, and I encourage you to, if you want to try it, you can use their release version to do that. But the new one is so much better. And it's as far, but again, it's in beta and you have to compile it. But UE5, yeah, like I said, it's just more work, but it's so much more exciting right now to do it, use the latest one. And so you can install this plugin. And I mentioned idle animations. There's tutorials on this MetaHuman SDK plugin. The MetaHuman SDK plugin, it handles mainly the lip sync, but it also has now some of the tools you need. In fact, most of the tools you need to make a chatbot system where you can type in, well, in this case, you need to, you've got to speak to the MetaHuman. It goes, it will take whatever you say, convert it to text, send that to some chatbot. In this case, I'll show you Google Assistant. And then you could substitute in the GPT-3. Ultimately, there's a way to do that. And then what the MetaHuman SDK currently does, though, is it can handle converting the text to speech using Google, using a cloud service. Then it takes that speech, runs it through its lip sync animation, and then that produces animation. And then that animation can then be played on the MetaHuman with the audio. So that's what it can do currently. And through other plugins, essentially with Unreal Engine, you can do all these fancy things through plugins. And that's where, you know, it's nice if a lot of the features are in one plugin like this one. But there's like, it doesn't have everything I need. So I'm adding in other plugins to do the missing pieces of this long pipeline. I was going to write a slide for that. I guess I forgot. Because you need, you know, several, you need all these operations going on. Speech, you know, there's a microphone, you're speaking, that has to go from speech to, from audio to text. Then, you know, the text then goes into the chatbot and et cetera, et cetera. Now, where is the chatbot? This is the chatbot test. So ultimately this, well, this is what can currently be done with the MetaHuman SDK. I'm going to turn on the MetaHuman blueprint I have. How do I recommend it first? I have audio on this, but it's not playing loud in the room. Go to your view. So when you share, there's an option to share audio as well. Is that checked off? 
Yeah, that checked. No, it's sharing the audio online, but it's not playing in the room very loud. Yeah, click on the microphone. On the, on the left, all the way to the left. No, all the way to the left. Left? Yeah, I think I have a couple of things going on. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it's, I don't. Well, you're remoting it there. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, this, hey, is, this is just a video. But you don't, uh, like. So currently, you need to type in. Um, this is it. If you, this is the audio. And uh, it converts that using. Um, Google text to speech, then it feeds that into um, so, the uh, chatbot, which is an inter interface to Google Assistant currently. And uh, the reply coming from the Google Assistant then uh, is uh, audio, and so that gets fed into the lip sync uh, gener animation generation. And then um, and then gets played with the lip sync. So I'll send the uh, word hello. So this again is sending out. So long. That's hello in Farsi. How can I help? Taking that and text that I write the reply. First audio sends the audio. Uh, I mean, first it sends the text to the chatbot. Chatbot gets a response. And it turns that into audio, runs it through uh, the lips. what the weather's like in Los Angeles. Sorry, I did not catch that. Oops. Let's try something else. Chatbots don't seem to know the weather. I <laughs> know, right? <laughs> Let's not ask them weather. What is your... Yeah, that's what you say. Favorite. <laughs> Favorite color. So I'm asking his favorite color. It's pretty slow. I love to help in the kitchen. So my favorite color is the golden brown of a perfect roast potato. What's your favorite color? <laughs> anyway, that'll uh, that'll be it for right now. So that, um, that's the sort of state of the art uh, of what you can do with that plugin. And so I, my plans are um, to add in the missing pieces. And so instead of typing your text, um, there is a plugin that, that you have. Uh, currently, it's a, you have to buy it, but there's a plugin that connects to the Boss um, speech to text. System. The one I'm actually using in, in Orange, Bosk is free, uh, and you can download the server, run it on your computer, and um, it runs in a small. It runs local uh, with a small speech-to-text model uh, suitable for. Uh, you could also use other ones as well, but uh, this one's available inside Unreal um, as a plugin. So I get that. Uh, then I then I already hooked up a microphone. In fact, I could show you that piece of it. Um, so, so there's all these pieces. Instead of programming in C, you have to program inside what's called a blueprint. And uh, or you can add you can do C programming, but learning C programming in Unreal is a lot of work. I, I've done a little bit, uh, but the blueprints are much easier to work with. Um, well, here, I'll show you the blueprint first, and then I'll show you that audio. So a blueprint is a way of programming. Um, and here, this is the level blueprint. Uh, that, or, yeah, don't get too uh, scared, but <laughs> it can get kind of big uh, with a lot of pieces to it. Um, let's see. But I, this was all given. Uh, outlined in the tutorials. But what you can see here, um, is it best to just zoom in? 
each piece I've outlined in a, in a block. So um, this first area is uh, sending to a chat bot. Uh, actually, there's some mixing. There's some record uh, audio stuff down in the lower left here. But this part, the beginning part, um, uh, creates that little box for typing and then sends it to the Google Assistant. Uh, and then this, yeah, here, here's the send chatbot Google Assistant part. And then you do a text to speech, um, and then audio to lip sync. So these are the high level functionality. And then at the end here is play it, basically play the, um, the animation. So these things can be abstracted to these blocks. And then this whole, this whole, um, uh, blueprint. Uh, it can be shared with other people. So you don't have to rewrite it. Uh, although they, the tutorials kind of make, you know, maybe I had to generate this myself, but to share with other people, I would just share the, um, this blueprint, uh, as a file and you could bring it in. Uh, but this is a, the way of, of kind of programming with plugins and, uh, and built-in functions in, in Unreal. One of the ways is called the blueprint way. Um, you can also use C++ programming. Uh, so in that lower left, I um, uh, the lower left there you just happen to see, or it, actually it's, it's shown here. So um, this demo shows you one of the pieces, that first piece I'm missing, which is use your PC microphone to record your voice, convert that, to, uh, and then be able to send that audio, or well, have that audio. That's what this does. The next step will be take that audio, send it to that Bosque system, and get back text. That is already a plugin. I just haven't dealt with, you know, installed it and purchased it and all that. So check this out. Now, I'm going to demo a um, audio capture program in Blueprint that allows you to speak into your microphone on the PC and um, Unreal captures that and uh, it plays it back um, in, in this case just to demo it but in the in the this is one of the pieces that would um, be work for the chat bot in um, that it would then send the audio to a uh, speech to text, um, which I'm going to be working on uh, after this. So here, um, right now you have to press a button, slash, uh, or whatever you want, and then it will start recording and then press a button to stop. In the future, that hopefully can be automated um, to be automatic. Hello, testing one, two, three. Let's try that again. Hello, yeah, testing. Try that again. Hello, testing one, two, three, testing, testing. So you can actually see some animation there of um, testing one, two, three, testing. what's happening so in that you blueprint. Can see what was happening um, with the debug on. That's yeah. it. Yeah, so that is showing a piece of the puzzle, which you know, I can now record my voice um, while playing this simulation, and it will and it captures the audio. And it's, I mean, some of these things seem trivial, but it's not trivial inside Unreal, inside this world where um, none of it was really designed for this exactly. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find a search the internet and somebody had wanted to record their voice. And uh, in this case, it even required me to um, set up a, a mixer so that it would not reverberate because unfortunately, you know, the, the game is playing the audio 
and you're using a trick there. So it's like when you're speaking, you don't want it to, you don't want the game audio, you're essentially to play while you're recording. Otherwise, it reverbs. So anyway, so there's like a little trick to that. But somebody already done it. And so now when I talk, you don't hear it coming out of the game at the same time. It just records it, and you get a you get output. Yeah, I like the the blueprint programming environment. Kind of like LabVIEW, the environment for Pepper, that robot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it is complicated, and it can take a while to get used to this. But and behind each one of those blocks, is there code? Yeah, there's code. Generally, like for a plugin, um, there's like these are from a plugin, and there's code uh, involved with each one of these. Yeah. Um, there's also a million built-in ones. Like you know, mm -hmm. you can say branch, you know, <laughs> and you can create a branch, uh, and that's a. Right, this right. is built-in, and so they use a true and a false, right, right? and an imp and a uh, condition that comes into it. Yeah. Anyway, so it's uh, I kind of found it a little bit intuitive as a programmer myself. I found some of it intuitive that you can just start typing in the name of something mm -hmm. in this interface, and um, it will might be there. And then also when you want to connect things, um, if you drag like the thing you want to connect out into space, then uh, it will. Generally, it'll start showing you the most relevant things that go with that. I might not have picked the right thing, but and there's probably uh, like yeah. debug little text things that you can put along the way to. to yes, you can do print. Yeah. It prints yeah. everything to what's called the output log, right. so you can see all the any kind of errors things in there. So this this is a uh, a reasonable environment, and it's all, probably a lot faster than programming. Programming uh, Unreal plugins is you know, kind of a steep learning curve, um, especially if, uh, for ones that involve the, the editor. But uh, even the other side, it's, it's, it's steeper than this, I think, um, because there's so many people programming in Blueprint. You can just, oh, and I found there's a website where people um, copy up these Blueprints. Yeah. And you can actually go to the website and do copy and paste into your Unreal directly from yeah. the web. So I'm like, oh wow, That's crazy. that is better than me <laughs> recreating these from a screenshot. You know, wow. I wish the Unreal meta, the MetaHuman SDK people had thought of that. Maybe I'll suggest it. They're kind of a, I think, a small operation, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So, uh, and yeah, the other one, like I said, I had. This is it's interesting when uh, I'm going through the web and going across. Uh, the level of detail has removed his hair because it's too compute intensive or something. <laughs> but as you back up, the hair comes back. Yeah. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you, wow. you you have to deal with. At home, it's perfectly fine. When I'm on my computer, it wouldn't be it would be showing his full head of hair in detail. Oh. But uh, when I'm logged in remotely, you probably have to bleach hair. Yeah, because. Logged in remotely, you're going through what's called a virtual screen yeah. and a virtual uh, video, uh, uh, you know, video system, really, video uh, GPU kind of thing, simulated. So it, it's a terrible, you know, it's not going to work as well. Um, but yeah, then in Unreal, like you, when you hit go here, uh, oh, there is hair came back. So this is a live use. So I, when I, if I type hello here. Um, this is the system running um, that blueprint you just saw run, running, except for the well, yeah, the uh, part most of it anyway, not the the, the uh, Hi, audio. It's code. really good to hear from you. I hope you're doing well. So the, yeah, the reason I recorded videos is there's so much more there's let no latency uh, compared with this, but this is you know logging into home and you can actually interact with it um, and in this way through a text interface so uh, you know, it's um, and eventually like I said this instead of being in Unreal I would export this whole thing to an application standalone and then 
Um, presumably, it's a much lighter weight and it could run on a smaller PCs and everything. You don't have the overhead of this entire editing system. Um, and so that's the, the future plan. Any questions about this or you want me to ask this? Yeah. <laughs> but general questions. So uh, Unreal Engine is basically for making video games, right? So like real time. Or simulations or anything real time. It, I mean, you can do simulations, but like it's primary in video games. And Sorry, it, it I did not good. catch that. It's really good at simulations because it's good at video game stuff. So the metahuman, is this design kind of like, is it targeting like a Call of Duty or Final Fantasy or something with that real time interactive stuff, or are they targeting something else with the metahuman stuff? Uh, well, I I can't speak for uh, I can't speak completely intelligently on what their intentions are, but they, I think they want it for uh, they they like anybody to use it, especially in video games. Um, or you know, applications like this are becoming more uh, on the radar. Nvidia is now has a whole plan to provide this through their um, uh, their Uverse system to provide all the tools with a block connecting system so that you can do everything from voice rec you know, recognition in a microphone to uh, animating a chatbot, uh, uh, metahuman. So, um, but the, they, uh, I think, you know, the, the initial primary goal or primary target was for animation, you know, for movies or for, um, or uh, some sort of video content creators that want to create a human, animate it, and um, and then and the video game. So it's both cinematic and uh, real time application, primarily video game. But they even when when you create a new project in Unreal, uh, if you have the full, uh, I don't have it currently installed, like the full uh, uh, there's like a kit optional install, but it shows you the different things you can. Great, yes, there's mostly video games, like do you want to make a first person shooter, a third person shooter, but they have other, you know, other kind of templates there for non-game. So it, it, that is a growing part. Yeah, I was asking, it seems very compute intensive for a video game, a lot of these meta humans running around. Yes, like, now, that's gonna work? well, the key thing about these meta humans is, and in fact, I alluded to it from the, when I said at the beginning, when you choose your meta human, you want to choose one from the website that says, you know, this one doesn't have a warning for low-end machines. And because it'll say this metahuman can only dis uh, display in level zero or level one detail, which is the highest level of detail. Um, whereas the other ones can't go to the lower level. So in fact, oh, I'll sh in fact, I uh, I might be able to show you if I remember where it was. There is um, uh, a level of detail uh, button here. And what you can do is tell the metahuman, there's like eight levels of, of uh, detail down to like this blocky, I, yeah, I brought it up on my screen. This is like blocky looking guy that you, does not look at all human, all the way up to what you see here. And everything in between, and each one of those is a different level of po polygons or, or in render time. So, uh, like as you go, uh, as you go further away from it, they automatically can reduce the level of detail. And in a video game, when there's many humans, they could reduce the level of detail, etc., automatically. So, the answer to your question is level of detail comes into play, uh, and then when you're focused on one guy or just a space. It goes up to as high as it can handle. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of potential there, and that that's been a thing. And I was in video games for five years as a programmer, in the mostly in tools department, but also in the game department. And level of detail has been around for decades, really, uh, the concept. And so it's just uh, the evolution of it is um, is now made it to these photorealistic humans, which is just kind of mind-boggling, the detail of these. Uh, it's really, um, it's hard to manipulate here, but the level of detail is something you've never seen before um, uh, until, until now. Um, so uh, it, it's, a, it's a great age to be involved with the, the, this kind of technology. 
a great time um, because you really, uh, I mean, it does take a lot of processing power, but also when you export it as an app, then and it runs on your PC, then the level of detail can can uh, take effect as well. And then the, the game engine, I don't know exactly if you have to do something with that in your blueprint or if some, well, a lot of it is automatic, based, because that's something the game engine itself could probably optimize based on what your your system has. It can like say, oh, well, uh, I'm going to reduce the polygon level. The, the quality won't be as good on that on that PC, but you'll still get the functionality, and that's what you want, right? If you want the you, I like if I have a chatbot, I want the chatbot to run even if the human isn't looking his dapper self. You know, uh, he's a little bit chunky, a little bit blocky looking. Um, not really. It shouldn't be that blocky looking, but it would be a little a bit less detail and the hair, especially the hair and that sort of thing. Um, any other questions? Uh, no, but uh, on, the, on the topic of like Alexa, if you ask Alexa for the weather, it'll... That works. It brings you the weather. Yeah, um, right. although like the Google, like for instance, Google Assistant at my house, right, uh, connected, I have a Google Nest, and you ask that and it's logged into my account, so it knows where I am. That will answer with the weather too. But if I log in using the web, using this free web connection, which what they're using, and I use on my robot as well. If I say ask Google, and I use this, this um, uh, it's a HTML or some oh, kind of inter it's an interface over uh, a request. Uh, yeah. With, that's not connected to my account, right. then it won't give you the weather because it doesn't know. It's like the general, it's like a general yeah. Um, yeah. connection, and it, uh, you can still use the assistant to do all sorts of things, but you, uh, it doesn't. It's not connected to the locality. I think. So this one is attached to a specific data. So not, yeah. So not this the web itself. This one. Well, this is in the cloud. The, so this again, this like um, this so chatbot is just an example, and that uses Google Assistant, probably the same interface I use in my robot, which is you through some Python code or other code, you can you can, with through a, a URL, uh, you can send um, a request up and get uh, in text and get the uh, audio back, basically. But it's not connected to any account, so it doesn't really know where you live or any of that stuff. Right, right, right. Um, sometimes I actually did at one point get it to turn on my lights, like it, it, it's it, it, in the past. But mm -hmm. I don't. I think normally it's not connected to um, that kind of specific account, but it still does its general purpose. Um, and so the idea here is, yeah, I would replace this with. Um, there is already a plugin to connect to GPT-3. Um, that is the plugins free and. Uh, in GPT, you have to pay after you run out, I guess. But I could, I yeah, I, I will probably try to do that. Bring in that plugin, and uh, instead of using this Google Assistant that they've provided, substitute this one in, um, because in that blueprint, the MetaHuman SDK people have been really good. They there's a place to just uh, enter to like connect your text output into the creator system that does the rest of it. So I can take any chat, any internet chat system or whatever, a chatbot, um, and if I can get it into a blueprint and then feed out its text. And the GPT-3, there is one. There's one for OpenAI already. There's a plugin someone wrote for Unreal. I could get that, and uh, I should be able to. And, and if I get an, uh, an account at uh, OpenAI, then um, I should be able to talk to GPT-3 and have it do the same thing here, except it basically send send the response from it instead of this Google Assistant. And and that that's what's important is the flexibility ultimately is to replace these components with what you want to do. Um, other than the the lip sync animation, obviously you want to use what they've given you here. Um, but there's anyway. So. Uh, that's it for uh, any other questions, anybody? No, man, it looks good. Oh, I've come a long way. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, Jeff. Oh, uh, with that, we will break for lunch. Uh, how about we come back at uh, 12.45? And so we can have a short business meeting. Uh, the Orange County Maker Fair that we uh, attended last month, if you have pictures, stories, or whatever you want to share, this is the time. Yeah, um, I can share my pictures or send the link to Alan. To, um, um, so yeah, it was, uh, here's the pictures. There we go. <laughs> so here we all, <laughs> we did a selfie. Uh, and then here's uh, Walter with Simone. <laughs> Thinking, what's the yeah, she's wearing yeah. clothes? Yeah. <laughs> what is this thing? <laughs> Talking to Simone. Yeah, she's wearing clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here with his robot. And, um, and then here we have some RoboCam. Uh, Orange took these pictures. Uh, oh. When you say take a picture, he points up and uh, find as soon as it's a person you want him to take, so he looks for the person. <laughs> wow, right in the middle of the picture. Yeah, and he, he, he scrolls, moves the, the servo until it's roughly, until it's kind Center. of in the middle. Uh, tried to do that, because I'm like, if you just say take a picture, then you have to like, you know, put your body way down or something. It's, no, it's not usable. Um, and then, yeah, I took pictures of these yeah. kids with the I tell you, it's uh, it's Our kind students. of inspiring to see how much kids really just take to robots. And, and, oh um, yeah, they. I was so scared because they were trying to climb on my oh, oh, black oh. and yellow one of the mine. But they, they trying yeah. to climb on. Oh right, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's a little frightening for the operators, but yeah. um, for yeah, them, they have such a great time yeah. that it's like. Uh, yeah. It's just phenomenal. Like, I mean, what's the future? hold for these are still shots from a video um but like i took to send in to I, and thomas was asking for the little guy he's well <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they would touch it too they want to touch the thing and yeah. you know as a robot operator you got to be careful or they might you know and they're yeah. heavy machines i mean they're like the foot of mine they're metal i mean it, it can hurt yeah but like really all these them. like i you know i found these frames were one, two, three, four, five, you know, five kids all like engaged mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, and then yeah, there it's the robots you know, <laughs> opening up. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that that was the best you know, photography I took it during this event. It's here about the same. What is that it? Anyway, um, so yeah, that's all I had for, I didn't, and, and there's been some other videos and things that were shared, but that's it for my side. Maybe it's all to count. It was a, a lot of people, we had a lot of fun. Uh, there was yeah. everything from the, what was it, that makerspace that was next to us. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 You made a yeah, cutting board? So you cool. made one. Yeah. Oh, good. Go ahead. Are you using it now? You can. Like you. I mean, I haven't yet, but you you put oil on it to make it sealed, I guess, or something. Yeah. It's yeah. I'm really excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> That's cool. That was a lot of fun. It was a bit noisy. I'm glad it was noisy, somebody it was benefited. Really, but it was too noisy for. Yeah. Like Jim said, maybe next time we'll see if we can get a quieter booth for yeah. our for yeah. our robots that that require. Yeah, visit. we'll write that in at this time. Uh, well, yeah, it was definitely right in. Loud, please, though. But it was loud everywhere, but yeah. we were literally right you know, next to 50 the feet, less than 50 yeah. feet, like 25 feet from the These industrial saws. Yeah. Industrial saws. <laughs> but yeah, what was really cool, though, I mean, I don't want to brag, but Orange was able to hear since I put, like, at least some of the time because I had put in that um, crowd. Uh, crowd kind of um, energy thresholding. So I actually was able to, under that amount of noise, 
I can yeah. talk uh, and, you know, get through and it would hear because it, it listened to that threshold and it said, anything you say has to be above that. And it's just, so you have to, you have to yell what you normally would do anyway, because it's so loud. Anyway, but um, I was, that was a, a benefit for me for testing, I guess. Yeah, nice. So, uh, just a proposal for like next event that we do. Uh, what other things should we bring? I know stickers are really popular. Stickers and the and the luggage tags were popular. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People so love luggage, those tags, luggage tags, but oh, they yeah. take yeah. work, right? Yeah, they, yeah. My printer had this this heat uh, this problem with uh, <laughs> what do they yeah you know, heat transfer or heat creep? It's called it's creepy. creepy. Yeah. No. We should creepy. make them. We should make them work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were the first thing too. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't mind making them. Easier to make a mold of them, you know. Yeah, you could, you could, yeah, make a make a more permanent thing as opposed to three D printing mm -hmm. all of them. Because then you could, yeah, just keep pouring, like make a whole bunch of molds and then pour them all at once, and then I don't know. Industrial mold, those molds cost a bit of cash. No, I mean like if you take one of those, put it into. Or maybe do it do it yourself yeah, like DIY like yeah. with a wax or paraffin or some kind of mm -hmm. you know, they sell that silicone. Silicone. I don't know the names of the oh, stuff. Yeah. Silicone thing where you can just like pour out some silicone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you your press part it in. in it, you cut it in half and you have your mold. Get a mold, but then how do you do like these yeah, had the two color. Or oh yeah. Two that's color. That's, that's these are two color so you can see the Oh yeah, you probably have to paint over the top or something. Yeah. But three D printing is definitely, you know. Doable, it works. It's just, uh, you know, you can do a whole bed of those and it just takes a little time. Well, yeah. Uh, did we have any stickers left? Yeah, I, I, oh, I should have brought, I guess I should have brought those, but I have them if anybody wants. I'll bring them next time. Just for, you know, for next time. Personal uh, design choice on the um, feedback on the stickers. I like the last stickers better. These. The ones we had before. You mean the old ones that said, I love robotics yeah. with the QR code? <laughs> I did. Well, then, this was our new design that we, oh, okay. right, you know, that, um, that we kind of got from the student from a few years ago with, oh, with our good. robot. It's got the same robot that, that Les just showed. Oh. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's our new trademark. Design. Yeah, so that's yeah. our, that's our, you know, that's our trademark. So unless we change that, there's, there's nothing else to put on this stick. Mm -hmm. really. Yeah. You can still do that and just put I love robots in the bottom. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> just these are nice small. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah, we could do whatever. But I don't know. They seem they're, fine. They're, I mean, they're fine yeah. the way they are. People still love them. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring. Uh, we'll, I'll bring them in next time. Sorry. Okay. I mean, just for just keep them for next time. Yeah. For next event. I have them for the next event, or if yeah. people want them here, I'll bring them to you. Okay. We use so, most of them. <laughs> next, uh, in show and tells, Alan. Okay. The Dazzler. <laughs> First, here I go. These are the amuse. They're hard to uh, impress, like homebrew. All right. Hold on. Uh, grab the right screen. Just a moment. There we go. Homebrew skill meeting on Wednesday? Yeah. yeah, last Wednesday of the month. I just, yeah, it was, I go to their meetings. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to pass around these. Um, these are K9958 servos. Uh, so they're the same three pin servos that you're used to, standard jumbo size. Uh, but they're uh, they're a little bit wider, but a fair amount shorter than the MG90s that you'll see used on a lot of projects. Um, so uh, over the past week, I was inspired. I'm uh, trying to figure out where that inspiration came from. I think it was a combination of Womp from Super Mario 64, mm. uh, Gossamer from Bugs Bunny, and uh, when I was browsing robots on, on Google, as one does, uh, I saw this uh, Lynx Motion Scout with the backwards leg design, kind of like BD, BD1 a little bit. And I'm like, huh, Chicken Walker, yeah. what could that turn into? Uh, so I'm, <laughs> uh, this is an equivalent of a doodle. So it's not a design. It was just basically seeing if the parts would even fit. 
and I am uh, I'm slowly uh, designing proof of concept components to see how how it would work out. But I've got this phone. Phones are Android devices with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, memory, fast processors, USB. You know all this stuff, uh, graphics, camera, and I'm like, you know what? That would be an interesting thing to integrate into a project, and who needs a head anyways? Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to continue fleshing out the Doodle. Uh, part of the leg design I had used in a previous version of one of my Todd the Quads, the Three Degree of Freedom version. And really, it's everything should work. It's just a matter of cleverly designing the links in between in a way that it's not fragile. But I'm, I'm totally digging the look. Um, I'm not excited about programming Android, but it's funny, Jim, that you mentioned the eyeballs again, because I, I want to do... Um, animated eyeballs, and I envision like some kind of a terminal thing down mm -hmm. below just showing status. So I don't know how far I'm going to go on it. it. Maybe I'll print it out. Maybe something else shining will come along. Um, but what's cool about this and why I'm passing those little servos is that it's um, uh, here's a credit card for comparison. Mm -hmm. It ends up being really tight. So I'll continue designing the legs and the arm components and start throwing some things on the printer. Uh, but I've learned a lot since Todd the Quad in terms of making things even smaller. Um, one of the ones that I'm passing around doesn't have tabs on it. So the servos aren't screwed in, the tabs are removed, and then they're basically glued in where they need to go to save some, some size. And you know the end result, I think, is just kind of cool looking. Of course, it's not functional. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> um, there will be some 3D printed hands that I designed that are kind of like open cuff, kind of like this. And you know, why do they twist? Why not? How can you wave without having a wrist? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's all controlled by, you know, a, a, a used a used cell phone. phone. Great, yeah. That's so yeah, hopefully I'll have something physical to show you guys next month. But so far, it's been keeping my attention. And uh, I just, I love the way that it looks. It looks like it should be a thing. So hopefully yeah. I can breathe some life into it. So <laughs> you build it, and while you're working on the Android uh, animated eyes, you can put, stick some googly eyes on it. That's right. Until then, yeah, I could just stick some googly eyes on the front and call it a day. There we go. That's a camera. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Eyes. I don't have distance sensing. Oh, but then they would put the eyes up above. Yeah, something to think about. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I'll, I'll keep you guys posted, and hopefully I'll have some hardware to show you next time. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Jim, you're up. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, um, this month, uh, I have um, I worked on Orange over the past while and uh, added a this point to I uh, did some a point to go goal feature on the floor uh, using um, yet another feature using the camera uh, the OD uh, OD Luxonis uh, 3D camera. Uh, so let's try to share screen. <clears throat> and so I have a video of that. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm still exploring what can be done with the um, uh, the Oak D camera and its AI. And uh, so uh, this is yeah, the presentation. I did this presentation on the homebrew robotics so, uh, meeting. So if uh, so, apologize for repeating. Um, so uh, sorry, it went ahead on me. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. There we go. So it using what's called um, a, a model, a, an AI model called Blaze Pose, uh, with Depth AI. Depth AI is the system that the uh, Oak D camera uses. Oak D stereo camera uses the Movidius. Um, a system from Intel for AI processing, and um, it runs lots of code right on board the camera hardware. Uh, it's got this uh, myriad 
slash NVIDIA's uh, Movidius system hardware and the software stack in that uh, you can upload models to it. And the models, uh, OpenVINO, which is a large source of, of AI models, um, are available that can be ported to it, and se several of them have. So there's a lot you can do with it. And those models, you just can load them up and, and uh, start working with them. Um, so my goal was to, uh, I wanted to point on the floor, or I came up with an idea of like, there's this blaze pose thing, it shows the pose of a human. It can, it can take a video of a, of a person and um, it recognizes that there's a human pose there and then it figures out the landmarks which is all the joints, essentially. Um, and there's like, I don't know, I think there's 30 or, 30 or 40 joints that they try to identify through this neural network model. So I wanted, I figured, well, what's a practical use of that? Um, one use has been uh, like this guy named Scott Horton, who I, I've been following, and he's a really great builder on the Homebrew Robotics Club. He used it to play games. So he had his daughter put her hand, you know, it said, the robot said, put your hand up in the air or put your right hand uh, on your head and, and things like that. So it used the pose to play a game. I thought, well, I'd like a practical purpose um, for my robot, which is to point somewhere uh, and go there like you would an animal, like a pet. So um, uh, this, the pose system will let you, uh, it will, figure out where your arm, the arm is pointing. And here's a capture of, um, actually this is, this, this is actually literal capture from a, uh, a just from a, um, a rendering of, of a, a real, from, of my real pose using this uh, part of the OPD visualization um, in, the, in, uh, in a 3D uh, extension. And so when I point, um, I make a, a, a ray, essentially, and the ray points to the floor, and we need just to find where does that intersect, the floor plane. That's the math involved. And it, it's, um, it's not that difficult, high school, early college vector math. This is what it looks like in practice, the actual um, OPD uh, pose, the uh, blaze pose system. And you can see on the left, that's the camera view and the 2D um, super uh, overlay. And then um, on the right side is the is a 3D visualization um, of the uh, what's happening. And uh, so this this is uh, the OFD to remind people uh, the AI camera module. And they've got a new you know the new one is OFD Lite. It's cheaper. And it does pretty much the same stuff. And uh, they have other, they have a whole line of products. I see, you have to hit. So yeah, that one on the right is is a, a 3D, all done in Python actually, 3D, um, 3D using the library. Uh, so this is what the model looks like in a, in a uh, just a diagram of how it's processing, but it uses a two-step processing uh, pipeline with neural networks. The first is to detect a, a, a human, a pose, um, of, that a human is actually there and is, and it detects that they're, um, it, it detects the pose. Uh, but then you need to find the landmarks. So it's a two-step process uh, where you find that there's a pose there, then you find, you figure out which thing is the head and the arms and the legs. And that's all done in this uh, landmark neural network. And uh, so what's cool is this can all run on the camera. You can also run part of this on your PC if you want. They have ways of um, uh, changing. There's two different setups they had in this particular um, model where you could run part of it on the PC or part of uh, and uh, part in the camera or all in the camera. I chose all in the camera because I'm not, um, I want, the PC has got enough to do on my robot and it's a very low powered uh, single board computer. Uh, and I don't know why I accidentally put that in there again in a different color for your enjoyment. Now here's, um, here's some captures of actual uh, 
software tests from on the um, from the, the robot, but processed on the uh, well. Actually, this was all in the robot. So you can see um, uh, my right arm is it, essentially I'm using just the shoulder to the wrist as the as the ray. I decided that elbow to wrist was not what I really wanted. So what you can see here is. Um, so I basically make a ray just out of the wrist to elbow, or me to, uh, to shoulder. And you can see down here, there's a little dot, that's where the, the intersection is in, on the floor. And there's a few examples of this. Um, here's another one. You can see in this case, I'm pointing behind me. And uh, this little tiny blue dot, sorry, it's, I should have made it bigger. That's where it thinks the, uh, the intersection of the floor is. From where you're pointing, where it's where you're pointing. So this I had to make sure was relatively okay before trying on a real robot. <laughs> you can see here it's the blue dot over here. Um, Orange, so go there. Here's the first demo. Okay, I am going. Yeah, I get it. Oh, this is better than my dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's, this was modeled after uh, an obedient cat. Yeah. Now here you can see this is behind the scenes. I'm pointing there. You can see it's figured out where my arm is, or now it is. It, it, actually, the camera has to go up because I want a, a, the, the uh, actual, if you don't have the human's head in the picture, the pose system doesn't work very well. You need the, pretty much the whole body, or at least the upper body for the arms. Then you can see it set a goal point, and, uh, and that the rest is normal navigation uh, of the slam tech system. Here's the second one. Orange, go there. You gotta do two demos, otherwise it's not happening. <laughs> it doesn't really happen. Okay, I am going. You don't have to hold your arm that long. I just did it so I could remember where I pointed. <laughs> or for you too. Should have had him say I arrived. Same thing here. Even from a profile point, yeah, I see that I move up the camera, even though it looks pretty good in this case, but a lot of times if you don't move up the camera, to get the person centered, it won't be a very good, um, you know, it won't be a very good uh, uh, computation or result. And so then he goes over there. So yeah, it took a little bit of work. Um, it was kind of really, I like, I love to get back into base, you know, geometry and some basic trigonometry. It's really, it's kind of fun. Um, whoops, I meant to pause there. So here's some some links at the end here, and I can I'll post these as well. Um, but the Google Media based on the Google Media Pipe Pose using Blaze Pose, and this is this is a uh, research and a paper written back in 2006. It's a long time ago, but now this technology has finally made it all the way into a product you can buy and just and load it up and and um, with Python, they can control all that um, and uh, get access to the positions of the body and all that. So, um, would you mind like running the demo one more time? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> you want the first one or the second one? Or this yes. Is what? <laughs> <laughs> so jealous your stuff works. <laughs> Okay, I am going. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. This, this has an interesting behavior where you, it's not real time. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so yeah, for those of you who missed it, I've got a system here where you can, it, uh, an AI model figures oh, out where you're there. Thinking. And I've adapted it to the robot so I can point on the floor and the robot. Okay. Uh, I'm doing. 
intersection of the ray on the floor plane. Based in camera space, by the way, it's all cameras a certain number of feet off the ground and then transposed into robot space and then um, and then back into coordinates, 2D coordinates. Here it is again. So as soon as you see the camera moves up, as soon as that disappears, he's already figured it out and, um, and then uh, the destination is set. And this is using the normal navigation of the robot. This is a slam base robot. And um, it's already mapped. You can see the room is pre-mapped. And it's just a 2D coordinate system and it's using LiDAR. Here's the second one. Go there. Okay, I am going. And I, I like to add in, you know, voice commands for everything. And yeah, I pull things in and I go, you know, I, I don't <laughs> I don't like just like engineering demos. Hey, Alan, you should show this video to your dogs. Yes, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Dude, what's up with that? Please, fuck. <laughs> yeah. My little voice thinks there's something like that you is on your finger that you must want. Like, you're like, yeah. oh, the food's over there. And he's like, what, what, what are you? <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, the conversation's backwards. Normally, it's like, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> It works, and it does, and then it's so impressive. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it still needs some work. It's not like live demoable. Um, and Orange developed a problem. He doesn't go left right now. I have to... <laughs> I, I don't know. I go think right, that, you can just take the right. The first hardware. It needs some therapy. 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 <laughs> What's that? Zoolander. Zoolander? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Zoolander. yeah. Zoolander? yeah. Oh, yeah. You I know. You can do a left. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's it. Jim, three rights will make the left. That's true. Oh. You should rename it Blue Steel. Thank you. And the code is on GitHub. Oh, I'll post that stuff. Yeah, that was a fun project. I used my whiteboard a little bit with diagrams. Nice. And, and you got a cool space map. there. You got a cool robot space. Oh, yeah, that's my office. It's, yeah. it's not very big. I wish. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I wish I had more room. I know. We all do. Everybody all does. Do. Well, at least he has a whole garage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> He's filled that's true. Room. <laughs> I already filled the garage. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Westminster. I kind of want to introduce yourself. Oh, nice. Tell us about your oh, project. We have, a, we have a presentation. Is that be okay? Yeah, cool. Yeah. If you introduce yourselves first. Uh, like you said. Yeah, so we're from Westminster High School's uh, robotics, first robotics club. Our team uh, name is the Cyber Lions, as you can see from our <laughs> shirt. Um, so my name is Ken, and uh, I was the one who contacted yeah. you, Ben, for today. And um, I am the one of the sub teams lead. Uh, I am part of the business side of the team. Yeah. Welcome. And, um, I'm Terry. I'm also part of uh, one of the, sub the business side as one of the co leads. Um, and I'm I'm a part of the electrical sub team. Uh, I'm James, and I'm part of the mechanical sub team. My name is Rachel, and I'm the uh, lead of the programming sub team. And I'm Min. I'm also part of the me mechanical lead sub team. Just a question. Uh, where yeah. can I find the Zoom? Oh, let me. I can mm -hmm. email you, you the link and, and you share it to them. Would you mind emailing it to my address? Since, uh, wait, um, can you do it to yours? I, I have his email. Okay, I wanna... can you, can, you can do that as long as you're yeah. uh, I can, email to me too. Can... I've never been hooked up to you guys. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. I, I... Somebody's over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 this is for the link. And then when you join, you just don't join on audio. Okay. There's the link.
Hey Bob, uh, the guy from Barnabas Robotics was asking yeah. about you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Me... Oh, good. Yeah. Jonas, of your cup. <laughs> My cup? Oh, McDonald's yeah. was the, the good line, stuff. The line, the good stuff. Yeah, the line of my McDonald's was so long, I was like, no. I oh, had really? to go to Carl Jr. <laughs> um, He's like, you break coffee. And they made it really good today. It's just you know, I love McDonald's coffee. You like the McCaffrey? McCaffrey? McCaffrey, yeah. Yeah. Just a regular coffee from McDonald's. That's what I get. Yeah, That's some it. people, yeah, it's been very good coffee for years. <laughs> yep. We don't need Starbucks, and it's always been cheaper than Starbucks. <laughs> It's about the same now. It's about the same, yeah. Maybe, maybe a couple cents cheaper. But they're, the quality is really good. They use uh, Arabian bean or Arabic bean. Arabic, or Arabic. Or Arabic. Arabic. Good quality. Yeah, they, they've always had that. I think that's been part of their... Yeah, but, but what they do there, the uh, you know, the, the restaurant, as opposed to what they sell you at the store, like if you go to Ralph and you buy the little K-cups or the little... Yeah, bag, I got... It's completely them. different. It does not taste the same. Right, well, those usually don't. I yeah. like, I even like the McDonald's K cup one in the cafe. I use those, but it doesn't taste the same as the one that they use in the store. And I read articles of that. We have, we have a lot of coffee, trust me. <laughs> We're big coffee. I've tried every machine possible. And... Oh, I have an espresso. I can tell you. Uh, oh, an espresso's better. I have an espresso, and I, I love those. Oh, an espresso is much, be, it's much better. I need to avoid caffeine now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna have to get an espresso and drink it. It's an espresso, it's really yeah, good. Yeah. A little not cheap. Well, they're cheaper than going out though. It's only a dollar for each cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think their machines are much better, like the quality and everything. They're very good, but yeah, good coffee is you yeah. know. Yeah, I've tried it. It's, it's La, La Vaza coffee is my favorite. Oh yeah. So that's, that's, uh, Orange County is the only place that I can find it. <laughs> Yeah, turn, uh, when you oh, join, you have to your sound off, your audio oh, off. Okay. Yeah, you have to disconnect your, disconnect your audio. Mm. That's a whole other thing. See, he's on mute. Yeah. No, no, that was him. I was on mute. Oh, oh, I was on mute. Oh, I, I don't get it on mute. <laughs> so I guess you can share your anyway. screen now. So you got my email, obviously. You meant Lavasa, like you, you get the grounds, right? The grounds, or there's a, there's places where they actually sell you the Lavasa brood. Oh, that's like yeah. that's the Italian New, best brood. Yeah, exactly. Newport Beach has yeah. it. Uh, I haven't seen. It. Yeah, I'll have to ask you offline where. Yeah, you I'll tell you. I'll tell you a place. Well, actually, around where you live, let's go up Newport Coast. Yeah. To the top. Oh, okay. a spot right there. Oh, and it's named La Vasa, is it, or is it? It's, no, it's a, it's a regular it's a like bakery shop. type of place, ah. but they only brew La Vasa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've tried every coffee place uh, in Orange County. I think. Oh, no, <laughs> just about every. There's a lot of small little ones that are really gourmet type. I like the logo. The lion and the little oh, yeah, that's circuit good. board. Yeah. 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 I like the shirts and the, the sleeves have the roll. Yeah. Oh. 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 All right. So, hello, everyone. We are Team 8521, the Cyber Lions. Uh, we are a team participating in FRC, the first robotics competition, and we come from Westminster High School. So, so who are we? A little bit about us. 
our mission is to provide unique academic opportunities to students um, that are unique to most high schools. Um, we want to be able to provide students with um, an experience that can provide the ability to strengthen communication, teamwork skills, as well as being able to apply skills in STEM, computer science, and general teamwork, as well as critical thinking. Um, we compete in FRC, which is an international rewards competition, and we want to encourage and promote STEM within our community. So we do things such as um, local workshops with local middle schools to try to promote STEM to a younger audience and students. Um, our team was founded in August of 2020, which was um, a COVID year. And so we were kind of, you know, starting off the competition um, with not a lot of stuff to go off of. It was all online and it was very tough to get through, but we eventually um, were able to work through it and we did get like a few rookie awards, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, we've been doing it ever since and here we are and we're looking to move forward this year as well. It's a student-led nonprofit organization. And again, we're based in Westminster, uh, Westminster High School. And yeah, that's about it. So what do we do? Well, we compete with other teams of high school students at a robotics competition held by FIRST, which is an international youth robotics organization that combines STEM and also sports to provide like students the opportunity to obtain hands-on engineering experience. And the mission of FIRST is to inspire students to share their passion for STEM with the community by creating and innovating uh, industrial sized robot. What does our scheduling our year actually look like? Well, we begin our season in January, so essentially what that means is that first the organization is going to give us a new game to build a new robot, which is really exciting, really stressful. Um, so we start in early, early January, like right after Christmas break. After that, we are given just eight weeks to design, program, build, and manufacture a 120-pound robot, and then we go to compete at regional competitions, which we'll talk about later. Um, but before that season actually starts, us leads, we are preparing our members. So on Thursday, we went to do a little club rush type of thing, and we got 60 members for our team. So um, we are really excited to teach our members um, all of the skills that we've obtained by competing in this competition. Uh, our business they are raising money for our team, and then I'll be doing workshops at local middle school. So I want to inspire um, a love for STEM that I got, and I want to share my love for coding with other kids. And so we're just preparing for the difficult season coming up ahead. Okay, so our team composition basically consists of five sub teams. The first sub team is like design, where we have to during like the first two weeks of our build season, we can and like after we get like all the information on what the competition is and like what necessary mechanisms we would want to have in our robot to compete, we start to design our robot on CAD using mostly on shape, but sometimes solid works because on shape is collaborative and you have multiple people work on the same CAD at once. And also uh, after that, two week process is done. After we have like a general overview of what we want to build, we go to the, the side where we actually build it and fabricate like different mechanisms and parts of the robot using our workshop and like machines and tools and like of course like the first time it won't work so as we go along through the season we reiterate and rebuild and like, redesign as needed. Okay and then so at the beginning of season the electrical sub team will begin with like designing a layout of the electrical distribution system. And then after Mechanical has finished assembling like the majority of the robot, we'll go in and start wiring up and organizing all of the electrical components. So as for programming, we're kind of at the end of the season, which is a little unfortunate, because it's really stressful to code a robot in just two weeks. Um, but we work after electrical, so essentially we code in Java. We're programming all the robot's mechanisms. We're programming the robot to go forward and backwards, to uh, see falls, to move, all of that. Um, so that's really exciting. And then we also code the robot for two different periods during the competition, which I'll talk about later, but I really love programming. And so the last sub-team is the operations management sub-team, which is 
the business side. So we deal with everything that's off of the robot. So you know how our projects can go up to like the ten thousands of dollars. And so, and since we are a Rock Bay Title One grad school, uh, we do not get uh, like a lot of funds for our projects. And we also want to keep, um, you know, the cost of our members very minimal. And so that's why we have to try our best to just uh, raise a lot of funds and get a lot of sponsorships. Mm -hmm. And um, anything that deals with the school paperwork or any um, like recruiting new members or any of these slides or interactive like Instagram pages, that's all of us. So um, this is, a, um, we're going to talk about our 2022 season. Do you want to participate in in-person regional? Um, so as we mentioned before, each year, um, FRT gives us a new set of rules and games in order to um, compete. So for our 2022 FRT games, uh, we, there are two ways in order to um, score um, points. The first way would be through the um, scoring goals into the um, hub lower and upper hub that can be seen in the middle of the diagram over there. And the second way would be through um, using the hanger, where robots would climb up to um, four different levels, um, each with increasingly um, higher height. And yeah, we also have two different juries, which will be um, introduced later. So um, one of the components uh, during the season is the drive team. And uh, it consists of the coach, driver, human player, and technician, and uh, these are their roles. And uh, they are the crucial part of um, our team, because if you don't have a driver for the robot, then um, I don't know how you can. Um, it's just, um, for the drive team, um, it, it was kind of like, we. it was kind of a surprise for everyone at the competition that we actually have a tactic with uh, using um, we have two different drivers, uh, one for maybe the more like offense, offense side and one more for the defense side. And that's just uh, based on our role when we uh, discuss with other teams who are on our alliance uh, what uh, our role should be. So it, just to show you that um, teamwork and communication is very important in this competition. And just like teamwork being important, we need strategy in this competition. So. There are two periods that I mentioned earlier. There is the autonomous period and the teleoperated period. So as soon as the are in the autonomous period, so this lasts 15 seconds. Essentially, what the robot has to do is get off this little like uh, diagonal track, and then it's going to go around and collect these cargo and try to shoot it into the hub. This is a little bit harder than it's <laughs> into the teleoperated period. So that's for two minutes and 15 seconds. Um, that's when going on the offense or the defense, they're trying to collect cargo, and then at the end of the match, they are going to try to climb the hanger, which is really cool to always see. So just here's an example of what the actual competition looks like. So here you are going to do this. Turn up the sound on the laptop. I think before, before sharing, did you, uh, yeah, it's okay. We don't, we don't need to. We got an Okay, so this is our robot for last season. It was named the Calvary, and essentially, uh, measurements every year the perimeters change. This year, the perimeter was 32 inches by 20 inches, so we were really constricted of like how much we could build, like within that certain amount of space. And then, uh, robot in FRC is mostly built using aluminum because aluminum is like easy to work with, with like basic tools and machines, and it's not it's really light as well. Considering uh, the last season our weight requirement was 125 pounds, and we were just short three pounds, so like we really need optimization. And then our sub system basically uh, our robot because the whole premise of like the competition was to intake balls and shoot it and hang on like climbers at the end. 
uh, we had our intake system, which was powered by pneumatics right there using a pulley. Or, yeah. And then we also had, after it uh, intake the balls, it went through the index, which went up to the shooter using a flywheel. And then because I heard it, we had, we had to have a certain angle of like shooting because depending on our positioning on like tarmac or like wherever, we would have to like, we couldn't, we didn't have an adjustable turret. So we just had a fixed angle. And then uh, overall, our, oh, sorry, in the back, you can see that there's our elevator, which was our climber. <laughs> At the end, we would go, there was like three monkey bars, there was like traversal, middle, and then low climb. We made it to mid climb using our climber right there, which used the winch system. And then overall, our robot was pulled by 12 motors, six sims, three neos, and three sims and climb motors. And yeah, oh, and we'll go into the design process later, but we mostly use polycarb and aluminum in our robot. Yeah, so our design lead was sick, so he couldn't make it here, but I'll do my best to explain. And essentially, during the design process, we started off with a drivetrain. So we ended up using a West Coast drive, which is like a term in FRC. It just means it's a three-wheel drive on each side with one wheel, like slightly like, they're not like aligned, essentially, but it helps turn with turning and like stability. And we were, it's powered by three sim motors on each side, so six in total. And after we designed the drive team, the mechanical team would go straight into building that, and the design team would keep continuing on until like the next step, which would be designing the next mechanism. So after our drive team, we just build up and start with like our intake and end indexer, as you can see there. And after that's finished, and like with testing and everything on seeing like the speed of like our motors and how what what we need to actually intake the balls, we would go on to the shooter. And before we mount like on the shooter, we have to like we tested a lot of like different angles and like before we like actually put it on a robot, we'd use like a, sh a chair and like determine like what angle we need. And it was like, yeah, it's a lot of testing and redesigning until we actually got to the shooter part. And after that, we attached our climber last, which was like the, probably the most simplest one since it's just a wind system that pulls like the climber up and down. And, yeah. Last year, we competed at Orange County Regionals with 46 other teams. And as a rookie team, we actually had regional finalists and won three awards, one of them being regional finalists, and then highest rookie seed, which was awarded to the highest seeded rookie team at the conclusion of qualifications, and then the author rookie, which was awarded to a rookie team that implemented and exemplified the mission at first. So it was a really cool experience, and we're hoping that we can have an experience just as fun next year. So um, we're here to uh, show you guys uh, to be more in the, with the robotics uh, community, with the community. But then uh, we also want to uh, <laughs> ask for support uh, because uh, we're very honored to be in your presence of uh, the robotic community and. Um, we're asking for if we can get some mentorship. And uh, it's just how we see this, you know, we are a new team. Um, we are lacking in all resources, including uh, men mentors. And uh, we're in need of someone who can help guide us uh, and inspire our, our generation of STEM and science students. And um, we have, uh, like a variety of sub teams, as you can see. So any of your experience will be greatly appreciated. And also sponsorship that we have um, five different levels of increasing amount with benefits and um, any monetary or in-kind donations are greatly appreciated. And thank you for your attention. Um, this is our contact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, we have to tell you about more of our team. Can we ask you a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. We love questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, you guys are a high school team. Does team members have to be from Westminster? Uh, no. Not necessarily, but all of our team members are from Westminster right now. We can make room for other students if they're interested in joining us because we always love to have more people come join us. But right now, as of right now, all of our members are from Westminster High School. And you guys mentioned that uh, 
during the beginning of each season, you guys get a new plan or a new uh, challenge. Yeah. So you have to start from scratch every time. So you build yeah. a new robot yeah. every time. We build a new robot every single year. What, what happens to the old robot? So there's only like a few things that carry over from each year. Like basically you're always gonna need a drive system and the same kind of bumper, like square bottom. But each year the task might be different or like slightly different. So one year it might be you shoot uh, a bunch of balls and then you have to uh, have two hangers. Another year you might have to climb or have one hanger, something like that. There have been like previous years where you have to pick up cubes and then climb onto platforms and put them in there. So it changes every year, but it's, kind of around the same premise every year. Um, it's either like the cardio being like uh, cues or um, all those uh, Essentially, basically, since we're a rookie team and we didn't pr like participate in like the past years because this was like technically our first year competing during our COVID year. It was like we built, we did build a robot, but then to like actually compete, we just sent a video of like what our robot did. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't much like the competition was much more lax because they're like, really no competing against anyone else. You just by yourself under a time limit. But then uh, this year, since the next year, since every year, like the robot like, changes and it, new challenges, uh, we basically can't use the same thing as we did last year because it's also against the rules. So you can't have like a pre-built mechanism or anything for the next year. But what we do is, especially since like we don't have like the funds to like keep our robot to like demonstrate, we basically, uh, we scrap it for parts and like the motors because like motors are really expensive. <laughs> and then so we reuse like all the parts of our robot and so we can use it for next year. It's very sad when we have to cannibalize our robot. <laughs> we always get yeah. yeah. So you guys as a rookie team, there's a lot of mechanical, a lot of programming, electrical. How did you cut up the speed so fast to get even that first one out? We had a mentor who is now at Chapman University. Um, he had actually created several teams before us, and so he started our team during COVID, the COVID year. And so without him, we wouldn't have done as well as we did last year or the year before that. But now that he's left us, we've gained enough experience where we feel pretty confident in um, our expertise for this year and helping our 60 other team members understand how the robot works and being able to actually build it. That's really awesome. You yeah. took all that experience and now it's here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, also to add on, uh, like. FRC, it's like a really like inclusive and like friendly environment. We had a lot, like during our start, uh, we had help from like other veteran teams. Like mm -hmm. we went to like the meetings and see how like they work as well. And they also helped us and gave us advice on what to do. Mm -hmm. Like when we went to the, like, our competition for like the first time, we were kind of like clueless on like how it went. Cause it was like, well, there's like 46 other teams, like each of like their own robot and stuff. And like everyone had like different like challenge like different like robots with different mechanisms and all to participate in the same challenge and basically like uh, we, we talked with like a lot of them and like learned and like it was really cool like just seeing everyone else and like meeting them and yeah you would think at a competition where there's giant championships and you spend thousands of dollars on a robot that everyone would be really competitive and kind of spiteful but when we went there our code was not working at all and we got a lot of help from the other teams, so we're really grateful for the, the such a welcoming environment at first, and it really makes this such an, an incredible, incredible and rewarding experience. That's great. So you have, uh, you have uh, how many people? Is it seventy-five? Me? So we're really shocked. We have sixty people this year, 60. which is a lot. Hopefully, all of us. It's a lot of people. Last year was smaller. Last year we had 37 people. Oh, okay. So it's our numbers basically multiply. Um, <laughs> Great. Our first year we had like 15 core members. And then uh, our second year, well, which was last year, we have like 30, 30. yeah, four, close to 40. Mm -hmm. And now we have 60. We were at the meeting on Thursday. And I, I look over for one second, I look back, and it's packed. The room is packed. I see people. Trying to look at our presentation and it was crazy. Oh, what are you guys using for the brain? Like, is it a laptop? I know you say that you guys use Java. Yeah. yeah. So we have a RoboRio, which is. You want to go back to the picture? Yeah, it's uh, based on uh, mm -hmm. uh, National Instruments uh, LabVIEW. Mm -hmm. Oh. It's very expensive, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's really high quality controllers. Yeah. So I think Robert used for all yeah. first, and then, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. National, national standard. National instruments that came in and yeah, they build it. That's standard for all teams. Yeah. 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 So every team has a Robo Rio, and then we have a Wi-Fi hub. I don't know where it is on the picture. Oh yeah, there it is. And then we connect to connect to it through our laptop. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. And I know that there's some some of our members actually mentor first robotics teams. You guys might want to uh, join our Google group okay. and post there. There's a uh, who's, who's the one that does? I did Carl. 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 He does a lot of uh, mentoring first robotics stuff. Mm -hmm. he, he's really good. Uh, but yeah. If, do you guys want uh, mentorship, that kind of stuff? You guys might want to post in our Google groups. Okay. All the information is in our front of our website. That sounds perfect. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What's your programming environment? It's, it's Java, you said. Right? Yeah, we do Java. So there are uh, kind of three ways you can program a robot. Um, there's Python, there's, and then there's C++. Um, just because I'm kind of getting myself used to the programming side of things, because actually, I got into computer science by learning Python, um, but so much of the resources for programming is in Java. So a majority of the advanced teams are in C++. That takes a really long time to compile for the robot. Uh, so I just like to work in Java because I think it's pretty easy to teach and there's so much uh, resources and online guides for it. And that's for the first 15 seconds of the competition. It's a problem. That's yeah, it's yeah. yeah. So After the robot is completely it's, controlling it's yeah. yeah, what I was going to ask, what happens during the, the uh, well, you actually mentioned, uh, but in a little more detail, during those first, it's not very long, 15 seconds, yeah. but it, it just goes, it gets off the tarmac and then finds uh, some of the resources, the yeah, balls. Yeah, the cargo, yeah. Cargo. Um, yeah, so that's, this is kind of where the strategy is involved, at least for this year's game. So the robot, um, so there are three robots per team, so mm -hmm. there's only two tarmacs, so that's there's going to be two robots, either right here or one robot here, which mm -hmm. is depending on which alliance that you're part of. Um, you can't pick up balls with other teams, right? Mm, you can. Oh, you can? Yeah. You can? Yeah. Okay, so essentially what you do is within those 15 seconds, you're off the tarmac and you're trying to collect as many balls as possible mm -hmm. to go into the hub. So we have, because yeah. there's so much variety in like where you can be placed on the tarmac, right? Because there's like four different tarmacs, mm -hmm. and it's two robots and one, one on the other, if you can use image. Um, we kind of have like preset templates that we upload to the robot, and it can do that template um, as soon as the competition starts. If that makes sense. So you're collecting, collecting yeah, the cargo. Yeah, collecting the cargo, shooting it in, and then as soon as those 15 seconds are over, Min, who was our driver, oh, yeah. was driving. <laughs> what do you, you use to detect the balls? Yeah. Um, What's your green light? Well, we use something called the limelight. Last year, autonomous didn't work that well. I think yeah. all our autonomous could do last year, because we were kind of programming on the spot last year because uh, we were really behind because all of our stuff came really late. That's a different story. Um, but last year, all our robots could do was go off the tarmac. But in terms of collecting the balls, um, I, I, so if you go to like, so if you see like on the top of like our thing, that, that black camera thing, that's our limelight, and essentially, it all has like a built-in camera that we would display on our laptop. So that's how we would look at the in, in boss, like intake them. But the problem with like during our season, we had a lot of problems like programming and coding issues, so we couldn't get it to work most of the time. I think we only got worked like one or two rounds. But then essentially, autonomous is really hard because you'd have to uh, also like depending on like the competition because we were. The, the entire area was like inside a hangar and the lighting was really weird and mm -hmm. so like one side would be like really bright and the other would be really dark so yeah, the limelight right. might not work on one side it work on the other yeah. and it was yeah. really yeah. We've, yeah. Been there. Yeah. we've been oh, there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've been there we went to a, we went to Boeing to show off a robot there and it was like with a bright sun and none of our codes for the limelight did not work at all <laughs> it was kind of sad uh, welcome to the club <laughs> <laughs> yep. exactly <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, batteries. How um, oh. how big are the batteries, and how much do they weigh? They're so heavy. Are they like motorcycle batteries, or yeah. maybe maybe like the size of this box, and then it's like a pretty solid battery, and we have to switch them out. We have yeah. like three on stock, like two are charging, one in the robot, 
we swap it out for a fresh battery every time we're about to go. And uh, yeah, it's in the back here. And it, yeah, it's really solid. I, I had to make a run. Yeah. <laughs> like we were about to start a, a round for a competition. And they're like, James, we need a fresh battery. <laughs> I ran straight over to the pit. I grabbed another one, did a whole cross country kind of run. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got back and yeah. They use, use light poles, right? For this, for ones, light poles. Uh, like yeah. lithium power, uh, lithium. Yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 There's a tiny light that shows that a robot's ready, but I don't think that's what you're referring to. No, the battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it 12 volts or? Uh, 12 volts. Yeah. So two batteries on the robot. No, just one. Just but we switch oh. them out. And, and it just lasts for one round. One. Well, um, it could last for longer, but you want to make it, it more like, safer to, to switch yeah. it off. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we put our robot on turbo mode. It takes an extra battery from mm. the battery. So you can constantly see someone running back and forth from the pit carrying a giant 20 pound battery trying to place it in. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the parts are uh, most off the shelf from Vex, Vex Robotics. Yes. Uh, and there's a new website that's been up of Vex Robotics too. They buy all these things. So. Yeah, those are those SIM Neo 775. I mean, that's not terms we were, I mean, most of us are familiar with, but yeah. Those, they're big motor. <laughs> what's the biggest motor? Uh, yeah, by the sim. sim. It's like Maybe six, it's seven inches. The size of my water bottle. Wow. Uh, and what's the power of it, or the torque, or how do you measure? Uh, it's like Newtons. I, I don't remember like the torque. <laughs> like, yeah. There's like a whole like on the website you can see like all the values and stuff like free speed RPM. And, like, and it's is, like is that like, one used for the uh, uh, is that movement or shooting? The shooter. Yeah. yeah. Shooter runs off a. Well, for, when we started, like, every year or every season starts, we get, like, a kit of parts and usually has, like, mm. three sim motors and, like, some, like, different parts that we use. So we just use that so we didn't have to buy more. Mm. But, like, sim motors, it's, like, it's not, like, the latest tech, basically. It's, like, heavier and, like, longer. And then, but so the newer ones are, like, the Neos. We bought three Neos. We should have bought more last year. But then, like, a lot of parts came in late. But Neos motors, essentially, it's way lighter and it's brushless. Mm. So, yeah. Some nice quality motor controllers they sell on the, on the website for Vex mm. Robotics. Yeah. Yes, the motor controllers are part of the electric part of your electric team does that, right? Yeah, you can see the motor controllers right there, and then everything else is down here in the center. Yeah, on my R two D two, I use uh, Vex motor controllers. Uh, oh. You just pop them onto the receiver of the uh, RC, and then they work. Uh, oh. You can mix it. In. Thank you. Okay, thank you to the uh, Westminster team. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. It was really nice. You guys are welcome to come in all the time. And next is John. You're up here. Bob. Oh, Bob. Bob. Oh, Bob. 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 <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John Davis is online. <laughs> so, this is my first time back in two years, only because uh, name, I've been, I'm Bob Less. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I've been I've been so busy with the scout programs. They wanted me to do STEM things for, like Cub Scouts, for example. They wanted to do a camp where they do uh, STEM. Uh, so they're they're kind of robots. They do at first grade, and fifth grade, or like. Bristle bots, I don't know if you've seen those, but they're basically uh, like a toothbrush with a motor on top that kind of oh, goes yeah, on the yeah. table. So oh, yeah. real basic and that, so they, the kids at least get in more enthused and if they don't understand programming that much at that age. And then um, this last summer, they wanted me to introduce STEM at a different level. They, uh, they wanted to introduce, um, this is the Boy Scout summer camp. They wanted to do affordable robot and they also wanted to introduce electronics, which was a merit badge and also catapult building and other things like that too. So, uh, and then yeah, the Cub Scouts, by the way, we did a Rube Goldberg kind of thing. So kids got all things from a broomstick, pushing it, making it push stuff. And, you know, it was a spring force and 
you, you can name it. The kids came up with all kinds of stuff. But uh, to be brief anyway, um, uh, they wanted a robot kit that was something that we could um, buy cheap enough, that was easy enough to program for a person who's never done anything with robots before. So, um, you know, I asked Walter about his robot a little bit and also uh, I inquired, I, there was one robot I bought the kit for off of a robot shop and I found out that uh, the software had a virus on it, so I had to backtrack and start over again. So the robot shop gave me my money back. So anyway, it's uh, don't use Mixly or whatever that brand. Mixly is the software, and I don't know what the robot is, but I told them this thing is no good if you have viruses on it. And I, I bought multiples of these things. So the one that I ended up buying was MBOT, which is this one. I think you guys might have had a presentation on this before. And the reason I picked this one is because I wanted fewest number of parts where they do some assembly, but it's not so labor intensive because when we did Lego before, they have like 300 parts in the box and the kids were spending all day building and everything. So mm -hmm. we did, this one's only like 20 or 30 parts. So it's, uh, you, they can build it within an hour or so and they have um, add-ons too, but we went with, this is the $69 robot, which for $84, you get a Bluetooth attachment and so forth. But um, anyway, we wanted something to where they learn programming and uh, the code is also very basic too because the kids that for Boy Scout age are from fifth grade through 12th grade. And so we want something that if the kid's never done any program before, we didn't want to get scared away with it. So it's, um, it's a kind of a, a drag and drop code, which is a block, they call it make block code, mm -hmm. which you drag it in. And so mm -hmm. it's like uh, the statements would be clear English language, like uh, if the sensor, black sensor is reading a one, then, and then you put in your next line of code. So it's so straightforward that they they uh, they can't really go wrong on it. I mean, it's not like syntax errors. Like However, they also Strange. offer uh, if you go into the other screen, you can do the real C programming if you want to do it the hard way. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. it's, but for kids, uh, at least to get familiarized, we had them do it the easy way. And then if they had time left over, mm. they would uh, go ahead and uh, and go into the C side. But anyway, the robot uh, that we used was uh, just uh, ultrasonic, ultrasonic sensing and line nice. sensing. And it has um, oh, yeah. one a third wheel here and... Uh, the standard wheels they use for a lot of the DC kind of robots. And yeah. there's a whole lot of kits like this, but this is the one that we thought would hold up the longest because of uh, you can unscrew it many times and put it back together. And mm. the only thing that's gonna wear out is the, the plastic that's inside of this wheel, but they give you spare parts. Mm. So anyway, uh, that's what we ended up picking because we wanted affordability so every kid can have a robot in their hands. Those yeah. little motors are pretty cheap, too. Yeah. 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 That yeah. yeah, was uh, 13th most popular uh, badge at camp. So that's yeah. what, you know, we were pretty happy with that. So anyway, it's one for that age group. It's not like we would necessarily like it as much unless you want to do just work in the C programming side of it. You can do that. But they have different versions, like I say, that are some are um, that have more attachments and more gizmos. This, this is the cheaper one. Yeah, there's like even a Bluetooth version that comes yes. with a Bluetooth module. Yeah. There's also a remote control for it yeah. if you want that. Yeah, yeah, it has. This yeah. one has a remote control in there. It comes with code already on it, where you can make it go forward, backward, do all that, and then it'll mm. do line following automatically, and it'll do uh, just by hitting one button, you can put it in different modes. Mm. But if you wanted, we erased everything and had to do it from scratch, and that's mm. how they really got to get the real practice of it. So anyway. For kids in that age group, it works out pretty good. And we had a, a ton of kids go through that. So it was a successful program. Well, we, we, these, we're gonna probably reuse them for like three or four years anyway. Mm. Yeah, so, they're very good. So yeah. like two, three years ago, I got invited to do some some online thing. There was a big online Latin America event mm. and they had kids using that those robot kids for that event. And I was one of the guest speakers. They didn't have many speakers, but and so they told me two months ago, two months before that I was going to do a presentation on, on a robotics in general. And then I said, well, what are the kids doing? So they told me they were using that particular kit because it's sold throughout Amazon in Latin America. And so I just went on Amazon and bought one to get familiar with it. And I figured I had to do like line following and things like that. 
and uh, and then I show the kids some tricks and techniques about it, and, uh, and then I gave it to the David Coda kids. Because I gave it to David Coda instead of Caleb. But it's a very good kit for like yeah. the competitions that we're doing here. Yeah. Easy to assemble. Yeah. Uh, it's and free Windows. software. And yeah. yeah, it has our Arduino. Inbox. And I think they have a Python version too, but this one is the Arduino one. It's Arduino. It's Arduino and Scratch in the same screen. So you yeah. have Scratch and you can say, I want to switch the mode to the programming environments. It's I want to switch the mode to Arduino and then you can see the Arduino code on the side. It's yeah. the like, equivalent. Of it's it like the other kind of. Uh, blocky programs where you can start off by doing dragging your blocks, and then mm -hmm. if you switch over, it shows you the corresponding yeah, stuff. Right. That's yeah, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, show you the translated code. Yeah. That's, what, that's, yeah, that's like a yeah. yeah. Um, so that would be that's like McQueen started. does that. Yeah, yeah like McQueen. McQueen. Yeah, yeah, exactly like the McQueen. But it's good because then kids aren't afraid of code because when yeah. they see syntax and they're typing it wrong, yeah. they get frustrated. Yeah. Kids don't like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it worked out good for this age group. So anyway, I'll pass it around if you guys have Yeah, the pro I mean, is it literally its own heart? Is it a, it's, it's this custom board, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole thing is sealed up actually. The chip so is, they, yeah. yeah, they don't, you don't yeah. open this. Yeah. You just plug in. Yeah. But it's, um. And even if they make it wrong, it still doesn't blow up. That's, you know, there's so many things. <laughs> I see. One kid, one kid got in there and torqued it down so tight, I could we couldn't get it apart. So you have to, we have, we make a lot of rules on assembly. By the way, for robotics merit badge, it's not just building a robot. They have to learn careers, uh, types of robots, um, or they have to learn, uh, like, uh, different, uh, kinds of mechanisms. There's a lot of other things involved too. Uh, but code writing and robotics was this is the requirement they met for that. So you taught how many uh, how many uh, cubs or actually I, I I taught um, other key people to relay it to teach uh, So I because I couldn't run the whole camp. I have other duties in scouting. I have I was doing five duties and this is the one I handed oh, off. <laughs> so anyway. So that yeah, a lot of kids. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of kids went through. But every kid succeeded. That's the nice thing about this kit. It's you know, I when we did Lego, they didn't succeed because it was too it was too, yeah too challenge. much assembly, and then they they we'd have to kind of walk them through. Here's what you have to do, and you know, it took a lot more extra time. Mm. This one, this is the way the solution I think for the summer yeah. camps. How many robots did you guys need? Well, you ended up buying 15 kits and 15 PCs. Mm. You could also program it on the phone too, but um, the, oh. I don't think the code was is readily or easy mm -hmm. to understand on a tiny phone screen. So we had no. computers. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's only a certain number. It's a very limited number of parts yeah. that you need to deal yeah. with. Yeah. The only other parts they have in there are um, this is the remote, and then you have the Bluetooth. And they give you the tools and everything and the screws and all that. There's extra Infrared. screws and a little screwdriver. So, I mean, that to me is uh, the way to make a kit so we don't have to go shopping, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. And this was, this um, basic one is uh, $69. Yeah, it was $69 last summer. I don't know what it is now. but yeah. it's Pretty good. Yeah, that's what I paid for when I bought one. $69. The Bluetooth one, I think, is $84. And it's a software, is it called uh, MakeBlock? Or well, MakeBlock is the software, it's a drag yeah. and drop software, so yeah. So you, you launch that app on your PC. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like Make Code. Yeah. It's yeah. the one I use for the, yeah. you know, the McQueen. Yeah, uh, yeah. same thing. Yeah. Make awesome. Code is Microsoft and MakeBlock yeah. is whatever this company. Yeah. What is yeah. the company name? Uh, let's see. Make Block, is Make Block Make the Make name Block, of the company? Yeah. I think they also, the school districts, I think, might even use this too. I couldn't get much information from the school district, so uh -huh. I had to kind of find it on my own. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's nice when kids don't have, they could just drag and drop and they make a mistake and you drag it back and put another thing in there and you don't have to worry about it. And then it has enough where it's got routine, it's got if statements and that kind of stuff in there where they are learning the ideas of programming. Logic. Yeah. yeah. Logic. The logic. Yeah, but the sturdy platform is what's appealing because you can do like arms, you know, for future future add-ons. Oh yeah, they can have add-ons. A bunch of little yeah, yeah. points on the, on the A lot of, things. yeah, front and back there's attachment points. Yeah, yeah I saw that. 
But but if you have kids that are like third or fourth grade, you can help. They could almost make oh, this without your help. One. But uh, if you have a fancy, parent that can help, yeah, you wouldn't pass it. Up. <laughs> but at summer camp, I, since I couldn't run the show for them, you know, the whole time, then they, I had to get it, it hand it off and make sure they could do it. So I, this is learn. in their kind of in their realm. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, how old are they? This is also uh, well, the ones grade? that did this one were fifth grade, fifth through grade. twelve, but mostly fifth through eighth grade, somewhere in there. Um, yeah. That's all I had anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Okay, uh, that was the last uh, show and tell that I have on my list. Uh, if anybody else online has a show and tell let me know if not i guess uh, we will wrap it up oh, i'll think about it okay, i don't see uh, anybody else does anybody else have anything else to add no all right so that will conclude the october meeting of the robotic society of southern california See you guys uh, next month for uh, Fitzroy, possibly. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs>